Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Sandbank, Vice President of Distributed Energy Resources at NYSERDA. I just would like to thank everybody for joining the future of New York commercial and industrial community distributed generation solar markets. Um, this is day two uh, of our technical conference. I think many of you are aware that day one on April 21st consisted mostly of uh, New York State uh, presenting out to all the stakeholders. And on day two, uh, we're going to focus on the state being more in listening mode and hearing some reaction presentations from from the industries uh, and all and several stakeholders. Uh, so again, thanks for joining. Uh, we have about 162 attendees on day one. We had over 400, so I suspect there'll be more people coming in. Um, so I'm going to uh, go a little slow at the beginning to allow people to continue to join our WebEx. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, I think I already did the introduction, so I can happily go to the third slide. So that would be the next slide, please. Thank you. So on this technical conference, um, we have a lot of the same people from the state that were on the conference uh, on April 21st. Again, we're going to be a lot in listening mode. Uh, you can see the Department of Public Service staff that are joining this call. Uh, and you could see the folks from NYSERDA that are on this call. Um, and we're going to have some, as I mentioned on the earlier slide, some industry speakers. Um, and we have three different parties that are going to be presenting today. Um, those parties had requested to speak and um, they're each submitted their presentations. So we're going to see uh, those coming uh, in the near future on this presentation. We have Dave Gall, who's uh, representing SIA, Shia Meta uh, of NYSEA, Caitlin uh, O'Neill from CCSA, and uh, Sam Jasinski from Borrego is going to be presenting, and they all represent the clean energy parties. Um, I'm sorry, Sam is going to represent Borrego as a separate presentation from the clean energy parties. And then we're going to have Stephen Wemple and Toby Hyde uh, be our speakers for a joint utility presentation. So there's going to be three presentations in total. Um, and again, uh, I will reiterate that this um, is a process. Uh, this doesn't start, start and end with technical conference day one and day two. This is going to be a, a process of which um, there's going to be ample time and different milestones at which uh, many of you can provide your feedback. So if you feel like you are unable to provide a presentation during this technical conference, no worries. Uh, there's going to be uh, uh, several different opportunities in the future to be able to uh, weigh in on your perspective as we move forwards. Um, and we'll get to a little bit of that towards the end when we get to our next steps. Uh, so can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, as we did on day one technical conference, most all of you are going to be muted. Um, and that's just so we can keep this uh, organized and structured. We've always find it best that you ask your questions in the QA uh, chat box portion of the WebEx. We will see all of your questions. When you ask a question, uh, we will see it. Uh, no one else will, none of the other participants will see your question that's asked. We're going to aggregate all the questions and try to answer all of them. Um, each presentation that is going to be presented today will be followed by a Q&A uh, portion. So you won't have to wait till the very end to ask questions on each presentation. We're going to have a presentation. We're going to pause and then we're going to allow you to ask questions about that particular presentation, answer those questions, and then we'll go on to the next presentation. Um, so don't feel like it's all going to uh, have to wait till the end of it. If we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So here's how today's agenda is going to going to uh, look like. Um, I'm going to start with just getting everybody up to speed again on day one technical conference. Um, it'll be a really quick and short recap of day one and what we presented out. For those of you that maybe didn't make the conference or need a refresher on uh, what it is we're here to talk about and what proposals uh, we had on the table or we left on the table uh, from day one. Um, so I will start with that. We're then going to go to a uh, presentation by the clean energy parties 
um, and allow them to go through their presentation and again Q and A right after that. Then we're going to allow Borrego Solar to give their presentation and again Q A right after that, and then a presentation uh, by the joint utilities again Q A after that, and then we'll touch the next step. So as you can see, this is mostly stakeholder driven. Uh, day two of the technical conference, and we're going to hear uh, reaction presentations based on what we presented out on April 21st. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, I will start the summary of our April 21st technical conference. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So um, on April 21st, uh, on day one, basically what I wanted to do is make sure that we all understand uh, what the guardrails of what we're talking about is and what we're not talking about. Uh, right now, really what we're talking about is a focus above and beyond the six gigawatt target for New York Sun. We feel fairly confident that we're going to reach that target without having to ask for additional funds, and we might even achieve that target uh, on or even before 2025, which is when our goal is. Um, we, we've got a lot of big pipeline. We've got a lot of projects built in the state now. And um, because of, of, of all of our collaboration with all of you and the hard work that's being done, uh, we think it's a very successful program and, and we're, gonna, we're going to hit those targets. The question we're talking about today and during this whole process is what are we doing um, post six gigawatt for distributed solar? And that, that, that's the question we're asking right now. And those are the answers we're looking for. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in the April 21st conference, we took a look back uh, about how we got to where we are today. And on the chart on the left hand side, we saw that from 2014 to 2020, when you look at project cost, which is the orange uh, dotted line coming down over years, you're looking at a project cost that came down about over 43% from 2014 to 2020. So as we're decreasing costs, we're also have decreased our New York Sun incentive, which is the gray line. And the gray line incentive has come down about 65%. So you can see cost project costs have come down dramatically our New York Sun incentive costs have come down dramatically and deployment has gone up dramatically. I mean, deployment, you could see, has gone up 545% from 2014 through 2020. So this is what I'm talking about. We have all achieved great goals um, and, and, and this is deployment. This does not include pipeline. This is actually projects that got built. So um, a, a lot of kudos to everybody out there who had something uh, to, to do with this and uh, really thought it was important to look at how much progress we've made from 2014 to 2020. The chart on the right is the total support um, for a typical community solar project, uh, either a national grid, uh, well, a nas in national grid. Um, it was too hard to look at all different utilities and being that the most deployment was a national grid, we, we focused there on CDG projects. And you could see um, the gray portion of the of the bar chart is the New York Sun megawatt block incentive. And then the yellow portion is the CDG incentive type, such as an MTC, a community credit, or a community adder. And when you're looking at the totality of the incentives that are given to a community solar project, and this is by megawatt, so this is based all on a megawatt, um, you could see the incentive has come down dramatically. Um, and it, it's come down, I think, about 127% ever since we launched the MTC tranche all the way down to the final community adder uh, tranche three. So um, uh, a lot of, of good cost savings, a lot of deployment, and this is sort of how we started out and how we got to where we are today. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. This is a slide that was presented by Luke Forrester from the New York Sun team. And um, this slide really represents um, some uh, uh, revenue versus cost for a typical five megawatt project, whether it's um, remote crediting or a community solar project. And I think, you know, we've put this out there as, as a demonstration that shows this is without any New York Sun incentive, 
uh, or or New York State support above and beyond the value the value stack. And I think what it's showing is um, through a community solar low cost project or high cost project that there is missing money involved here. But um, that missing money has really tightened over over the time when you saw in the prior chart to how much costs are going down. Um, so, so we admit there is missing money, but we also would like to point out that the missing money is getting smaller and smaller over time. So, um, this is, this is a very telling slide. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, how important is distributed solar and why would we consider, uh, extending it beyond the six gigawatt target? And, you know, some of the areas at which we understand why um, distributed solar is very, is, is very important to the state is number one, um, of the 12,000 plus solar jobs uh, in the state in, in 2019. Uh, in the last report, there, there, there obviously a lot of those jobs are tied to distributed solar because that's where most all the deployment came from. Um, the solar, especially community solar, uh, really is a vehicle and an opportunity to allow greater access to clean energy for all New Yorkers. And I'd say predominantly a really good vehicle to uh, provide uh, low income support and disadvantaged community support uh, and bill credit in, in, lieu, in, in form of bill credits. Um, so it's a great vehicle to serve the low income demographic in New York State across the state. Um, as you saw in one of those slides, our cost reduction trajectory is looking very positive. So, you know, let's keep a good thing going and, and continue to drive down costs in the state. Um, we obviously are going to count, you know, every solar panel that goes into the ground and any megawatt hour that's generated as a part of the 70% renewable by 2030. And these are some early wins for us as far as getting um, several gigawatts in the ground, um, you know, and, and increasing our renewable impact uh, on, the on the way to the 70% goal. Uh, we obviously, um, solar adds resource and geographic diversity to New York State's renewable energy portfolio and where solar is placed uh, on the distributed side, it's closer to the load where projects uh, you know, would be more challenged. So obviously that is a benefit to the grid. Um, so that's just a handful of different reasons why uh, we think distributed solar is very important for the state and why we should consider um, advancing it beyond the six gigawatt target. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, in the last presentation on day one, Carl Moss from our team at NYSERDA, um, you know, talked us through this slide about, you know, what, what is the future of distributed solar? There is missing money. How do we fill that gap? What's the best way from a ratepayer perspective? What's going to uh, help solar projects move forwards? Um, how do we transition from a New York Sun style megawatt block program to maybe something else? And what we looked at here is the first is establishing a value of carbon. Uh, we have uh, several different uh, concepts we were looking at here. One is the monetary cost of damages. I, I liken this to the social cost of carbon. Um, it's a damage-based approach where we administratively, administratively set an externality value that's equal to the social cost of carbon. Um, we do know that uh, DEC has set out guidelines that has um, dramatically increased the social cost of carbon because it went down to a 2% discount rate. Um, you know, we, we looked at the missing money uh, in a prior slide and um, the, the uh, social cost of carbon would dramatically drive up the E value to a point where is, in, in my opinion, beyond the missing money. So we said, okay, well, let's look at it a marginal abatement cost. And that is really, what is the missing money and how would we uh, understand how to find that missing money for projects? 
Um, there are a couple different ways to, to find the missing money and, and, and provide projects with that missing money. Um, one is a market-based approach, which is a competitive solicitation, um, which obviously uh, we presented on day one. Um, uh, we understand that competitive solicitations have, have failed in other states uh, and have been successful in other states. And, um, you know, if we would consider a competitive solicitation, we really would have to ask ourselves, what did other states do that didn't work? And how can we do a competitive solicitation that uh, tackles those barriers and tackles those issues? And how can we do it better than other states if we went in that direction? So uh, a competitive solicitation approach was one approach on the table. Another one was an administrative approach uh, based on modeling of a supply curve, price versus quantity. It basically, um, analyzes the missing money and could provide it in form of an e-value um, or, or different different ways. But um, those are two different approaches we went over uh, in day one. There's clearly pluses and minuses to each approach. And I believe we'll probably hear uh, from the presenters today um, what their feelings are on that and then maybe even hear some other approaches that we should consider. And uh, I will have, I would be glad to say, I don't have a horse in this game. Um, and, and I think that we all from the state uh, are being very open-minded to all presentations. We really want to hear what people have to say. And every concept, every idea we're going to be listening to, we're going to listen to as if um, that could be the that could be the step forwards and ask really diligent questions about um, what are the pluses and minuses to that perspective? Because clearly, I, I would assume we're going to see some different perspectives today and we're going to have to weigh uh, all of those perspectives as we move forwards. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so now um, we are going to start. Uh, Dave Gall uh, from SIA, I believe, will lead off the presentation by the Clean Energy Parties. Um, I will pause now and see if Dave Gall can unmute himself and uh, do an audio check so we could all hear him. Oh, okay. Shiam is going to start first. I apologize. Shiam, why don't you unmute and uh, do an audio test for us, please? Hi there, good afternoon. Uh, can folks hear me? Uh, we can hear you perfectly, Shiam. We can see you. <clears throat> Pardon me. We can see you perfectly. Uh, thank you for joining. I'm going to uh, go on mute and I'm going to hide my video as well. And I'm going to hand the reins over to Shiam. Shiam, I'm sure you might hand the reins over to some of your colleagues throughout this pr uh, presentation. And then we'll again pause at the end of your presentation and wait for the questions to be asked. Thank you. Great, thank you, David, and uh, thanks to DPS and NYSERDA for giving uh, myself and my colleagues the opportunity to present our uh, perspective and recommendations on, on the path forward for, uh, for CNI and CDG um, um, following the uh, post the six gigawatt milestone as, as David uh, just alluded to. So uh, my name is Shyam Mehta. I am the executive director uh, of the New York Solar Energy Industries Association, or NICEA. And um, if we could just move to the next slide, and the one after that, actually. Um, so I'm, and and one one ahead as well. Sorry. So just to um, so I'm here, obviously representing uh, NICEA, but also uh, representing. Um, the Clean Energy Parties Coalition, along with my colleagues from the uh, Solar Energy Industries Association, Dave Gall, as well as uh, Caitlin Kelly O'Neill uh, at the Coalition for Community Solar Access. So our three organizations, together with uh, a number of others, including the Alliance for Clean Energy New York, as well as Vote Solar, uh, comprise the Clean Energy Parties Coalition. Um, so just um, in case, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with, with the Clean Energy Parties uh, label, we are uh, a coalition of clean energy organizations, both uh, industry associations as well as uh, energy and environment uh, advocacy groups, and uh, comprise a substantial portion of the clean energy organizations in New York overall. Um, and uh, speaking for my uh, myself and my trade association counterparts, uh, we collectively represent uh, hundreds of companies uh, building distributed solar and storage projects uh, throughout the state. So the perspective that we're going to share here today is 
is really the perspective of the uh, so distributed solar and storage uh, industry in New York and is informed by uh, on the ground experience developing um, DG solar as well as including community solar as well as other uh, non residential uh, distributed energy projects. So my role uh, today will be just to provide some uh, context and background for the more detailed uh, recommendations that my colleagues, uh, I'll be handing over to my colleagues to make. But uh, moving on to the, the next slide here, uh, just to provide some context for the discussion at our end that is to follow. So first of all, you know, as 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 my my good friend David Sandbank uh, rightly pointed out, you know, before we talk about the the challenges and the concerns, uh, and uh, it is important to acknowledge the success that that has we've all collectively attained so far. Uh, New York, um, as as in in terms of 2020 installations, was uh, the, the 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 top ranked state market for community solar. Uh, deployment and the second largest uh, in terms of cumulative uh, installations for uh, community solar overall as of the end of 2020. So it's important to point to the fact that you know we have uh, we have done uh, again a, a great job in 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 setting up the market uh, over the last uh, five and some years. And it's important to acknowledge the vision and the support of uh, the the Public Service Commission, the Department of Public Service, as well as NYSERDA in in setting up the market for the success that it has achieved to date. Now that said, uh, the reason we're here today um, is that we are currently at a crossroads as far as community solar is concerned due to the exhaustion of the upstate community adder as well as the near exhaustion of the uh, community credit in Con Edison territory, which are two critical incentives that have uh, uh, driven community solar, uh, community solar success again in the state so far. And because of the loss and impending loss of these key incentives, uh, CDG development overall has essentially been in a in a holding pattern since uh, earlier this year. Uh, and without additional action and support, we we do face the risk of falling into the same uh, boom bust kind of paradigm that we've seen with other state markets when uh, incentives have suddenly expired, uh, and then uh, leading to de development and then later installations. Uh, falling off a cliff, and and that is just following uh, again the the attainment of 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 the top rank uh, community solar market just last year. So that is really not a dynamic we want to see repeated in New York. We want to build on these gains, and um, as as David just pointed out that and 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 was covered in the first technical conference, uh, NYSERDA presented some high level analysis pointing to the fact that with the with the loss of the incentives, as as was mentioned. Uh, the current uh, uh, the, the project economics for CDG and actually even for remote crediting projects uh, are, are such that project costs currently are above revenue. So there is a, a definite shortfall uh, or missing money uh, with the loss of the incentives that we mentioned, and and that is uh, responsible for the, the the juncture that we're currently at. Um, now the good news. Uh, from from our perspective, is that with the right approach, uh, which again we will go into in detail in a few moments, with the right approach, uh, NYSERDA and DPS uh, can achieve um, a long-held, uh, well-established state policy goal of eliminating incentives once and for all for DG Solar, um, at least for what you would say vanilla projects, and but and and continue to promote CDG market development. So. The good news is that we don't need to really reinvent the wheel here. We don't need to restructure the entire market support mechanism structure that we've spent the better part of almost five years uh, refining and uh, through, a, uh, through a very robust and comprehensive stakeholder process. And I'm speaking here about the value of distributed resources or VDR tariff, or, or also known as the value stack. Uh, that is the, the, the current uh, uh, compensation mechanism through which DG solar projects, uh, non-residential or CNI and CDG projects uh, are, are compensated. Um, and that is the right approach that I, I was speaking about earlier. Uh, so we'll be talking about that in detail, what that in, in, specifically how we believe the, the value stack tariff uh, needs to be updated. Uh, and, but then uh, we'll also be speaking uh, later about the, the, the need for a uh, new uh, DG solar goal above and beyond the uh, six gigawatt goal that we have for 2025. Um, 
and our uh, and, and, and the need to establish a new, new DG Solar Goal, both to continue DG, DG policy improvement, uh, but also help us achieve our out-year CLCPA goals, which, uh, which is 70% uh, renewable electricity generation uh, by 2030 and 100% uh, carbon uh, decarbonized electric grid by 2040. These are lofty goals. And we believe that that uh, DG and uh, DG Solar specifically, and and even more specifically, community distributed generation and community solar has a critical uh, role to play in achieving these out year goals beyond the six gigawatt DG Solar goal. So, if we move to the next slide, I just want to uh, focus a little bit more on the point I just made about um, about eliminating incentives and moving to a a, 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 a truly value based compensation paradigm. So. Um, and I guess at a high level, uh, I, the one 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 point to make here is that the the current uh, juncture we are at uh, with regard to the loss of these these critical incentives, um, uh, uh, as well as the 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 uh, pathway to improve the the uh, the the veto tariff through the adoption of uh, DEC's uh, social cost of carbon guidance into an, in improved and updated environmental value component of the stack. Uh, both of those actually provide an opportunity to uh, finally get out of the incentive game once and for all, uh, which uh, as you can see from this slide, you know, there is it, it, uh, eliminating incentives uh, has been a long uh, established principle uh, since the early days of, of REV, where the, 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 F, the, 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 the um, onus from right from the get go was that the, that at a certain point we would move to a truly value-based compensation paradigm where projects would be this DG projects would be uh, compensated com accurately compensated based on their contribution um, uh, on the value that they provide to the electric grid and to ratepayers. And so uh, again, just repeating what I was saying, the the current you know crisis, if I can call it that, as well as the 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 um, provisions of the CLCPA. As well as the, uh, the 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 guidance on the social cost of carbon issued by the by DEC provide a clear pathway to actually getting to that point and eliminating incentives uh, once and for all. Uh, so if we can move to the next slide, um, and and again the the my colleagues will be uh, fleshing out our specific recommendations on 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 uh, on how and. And why the the environmental value tariff of, of of the value stack could be updated, but I just want to spend a, a, a couple more minutes before we go into those, just talking about the the urgency of the the current uh, the, the the situation we find ourselves on and the need for for action and timely action. So right now, as I mentioned, uh, you know we, uh, uh, we 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 have been in a in a holding pattern essentially for community solar and CDG since around this February when the upstate community adder went out. So um, we are currently in a situation that where solar companies, uh, developers are making, are having to make investment decisions on projects uh, without having clarity on any kind of updated compensation structure and without, uh, without project economics penciling out for a large uh, volume of projects that are currently in the interconnection queue. So these projects are currently, uh, it, by our count in excess of three gigawatts of, of CDG projects that are essentially under the gun for either 25% payments or 75% interconnection payments, needing uh, needing needing support and needing a directional signal from the state uh, with regard to their future. And without that near-term confidence and signal, uh, firms are unable to make those investments. And ultimately this is going to result in a in a in 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 a in a in, in erosion of of projects in the pipeline, and ultimately uh, impact the state's ability to hit the uh, the the out year clean energy deployment goals that it has set for itself. So again, coming back to what I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, it's very important to keep in mind that again, you know, despite all this concern and the challenges, we don't think that a, again a major structural overhaul of the uh, of of the market support mechanism or market support paradigm is required. We, it's really a question of making uh, tweaks to the existing veto structure, which again we spent four or five years uh, getting right. Uh, and again, we we believe there is a clear legislative and regulatory uh, pathway and directive to actually up uh, update and improve veto there. 
uh, that should not require a long complex process to design an, uh, a completely new compensation mechanism. Uh, so if you could move to the, the next slide, um, I believe there's just a couple of more slides from, from myself. Again, just stressing the need for timely action here. So, and, and, and also uh, 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 the, the need for essentially retroactive applicability of any uh, improvements in the value stack uh, pertaining to the recommendations we're making. So again, the, 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 the block, the text block that you see on this slide here, just uh, it, it clearly outlines the fact that we, uh, we that the uh, upstate community adder incentive was fully allocated in, in the key territories of national grid, NYSEG, and RG and E uh, as of February 1st of this year, which was a little more than three months ago now. Uh, there's very little uh, volume uh, of incentives left in the other uh, two upstate territories, namely Central Hudson and ORU. And then the uh, Con Ed community, community credit, as I mentioned, is also uh, dwindling very quickly. It had been almost completely allocated. Uh, as of the 1st of April and, and should be completely allocated probably in the next month or so. And there is no backstop right now, or there's no incentive that is, uh, or uh, funding that is available to currently make up for the loss of these funds. Uh, and so with around three gigawatts or more than three gigawatts of projects essentially stranded in the queue without further support or without a directional signal, uh, we strongly, strongly believe that any compensation updates for them to be really useful to projects, to these hundreds of projects where, you know, reflecting millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars investment, uh, as, as well as hundreds, if not thousands of jobs that would be created from their construction and deployment uh, for any for 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 any improvements down the line to be uh, ultimately useful to to the projects that need them. Uh, compensation updates need to be retroactively available to projects that have made their 25% interconnection payments or at least allow projects to opt in into a new compensation structure should they choose to. And uh, there is a precedent in terms of you know, uh, fast action uh, where the DPS has made compensation updates available to projects retroactively. So what we are proposing here is not something new. Uh, in 2018, for example, uh, DPS staff did recommend uh, and was ultimately authorized by the PSC in April 2019 that projects could receive the updated demand reduction value or DRV uh, compensation if they had qualified after the date of the publication of the draft DRV white paper, which was published in July 2018. So there is there is a clear precedent um, from the past in terms of making uh, any any improvements retroactively available to projects that need them. Um, and then just the last slide, if we can just move forward. Again, pointing to the need for timely action here in terms of uh, um, uh, in, in terms of, of, of the risk to pipelines and the risk to investment and jobs, we've already seen uh, a significant slowdown in CDG project development activity, both upstate and downstate. And uh, our member firms are uh, already experiencing slowdowns uh, in terms of this activity. Uh, they are grappling and struggling with investment decisions about uh, which projects to continue uh, investing in. Uh, versus uh, pulling out of the queue. And just in terms of providing a little bit of uh, numerical uh, color here on, on the potential impact. So we, uh, the Clean Energy Party surveyed four of the leading community solar developers in New York State and asked them to estimate the impact of the current uncertainty and the, the impact of the status quo situation being extended on their uh, New York DG solar uh, uh, pipelines and just those four firms uh, aggregated results from that that survey of those four firms indicates more than a hundred projects of those four, four firms are essentially at risk uh, representing almost 500 megawatts in the pipeline and those 500 megawatts represent any year between around uh, 2500 to 5000 in excess of 5000 jobs essentially uh, at stake here so it is not a small number we're talking about especially when you extrapolate that to the 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 the, the broader industry so uh, it's really just a snapshot of, on the effect of major companies. So again, the, the need for, for, for action here is, is, very, is very real uh, and, and the need for timely action is very real as well. So I think that was the last slide that I had. Again, just trying to set some overall context and background for uh, the specific recommendations we're going to make on, on, in terms of leader uh, improvements. And for that, I will turn things over to my colleague, uh, David Gall from the Solar Energy Industries Association. Okay, thanks, Gio. Appreciate that. 
Um, we can move on to the next slide, slide please. And again, uh, my name is David Gall. I'm the Senior Director of State Policy for the Solar Energy Industries Association. Um, so, so Sham did a great job of setting up the, the context and the background of why we need to make some adjustments to the tariff. And what I'm going to do is try to explain, uh, we think the most uh, expeditious options that are on the table and um, you know, give a little bit of the history of how the current um, environmental value portion of the value stack tariff uh, was arrived at and then what could be done to improve it. So that's the, the um, quick snapshot of what I'm gonna talk through today. So before we dive into the slides, I just wanted to uh, explain the environmental component of the value stack and how, uh, give a little bit of the history here. Um, I think as most of uh, most of the people on this webinar know, the E value uh, in the uh, initial order from the Public Service Commission was established at e the greater of one of these values, either the tier one rec price or the social cost of carbon. And in the commission, the commission uh, exercised good judgment here by by setting up the calculation that way, because it, it, I think it recognized at the time that the the damages associated with climate change um, were, were increasingly looking to be very significant and that um, the REC-based approach to just providing an E-value credit didn't quite capture the, the, um, the damages that would, be, uh, that would affect us as a result of uh, continued uh, emissions contributing to climate change. So um, as a result in 2018, the Department of Public Service uh, issued its first um, comparison of those two values of the uh, established uh, clean energy standard rec price, and then uh, it made its estimate of the social cost of carbon. That was published in 2018. It was uh, essentially uh, a value that was included in all of the, the tariffs across the utility companies, and uh, it set the E value at the time. Fast forward a bit to 2020. Um, as part of the Climate Leadership and Community, uh, Community Protection Act, uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation was required to take a look at the social cost of carbon calculations and estimate what those values should be. And so in, at the end of 2020, the, the DEC published that updated guidance and uh, made its recommendations to state agencies for uh, how to value the, uh, an avoided ton of carbon in their regulatory decisions and in cost-benefit analysis. And so that's where we are today. Now we have some, something of a difference between the, the approach the DEC had recommended um, for cost benefit analysis and then the calculations that DPS had advanced in 2018 uh, to determine those values as well. So let's move on to the next slide, please. So I think the, the policymakers have recognized that there's, there's this discrepancy that exists now. And so this is a, a quote from a letter that was submitted by Assemblyman Steve Engelbright and Senator Todd Kaminsky. And these are chairs of the, this, uh, the state's environmental conservation committees and built houses. And essentially what they're saying here is that uh, there is a disconnect between the approach that DEC has uh, advanced and uh, the calculations that were used by the DPS to establish the E-value uh, years before the, the law was passed. It was, it's understandable. But they're recommending that those, those, that difference be, be um, reconciled and that the uh, two approaches uh, come together. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is somewhat of a recap of what we talked about at, at the first technical conference but it, it goes into some depth about the DEC guidance itself. And so what does the DEC guidance actually say? It, the, the quote here is, that, is a quick snapshot, I think of kind of the entire, uh, the entire document, but it essentially establishes these two approaches as David Sandbank said at the top of the, top of the meeting today. Regulators can either take a damages-based approach in establishing what an avoided ton of carbon looks like, or they can use this marginal abatement cost approach in uh, also, uh, uh, trying to understand what an avoided ton of carbon could mean. And so that's the, the foundational background for a lot of our recommendations and how to update the E-value to be consistent with this guidance. Next slide, please. There we go. So method one, social cost of carbon or a damages-based approach. 
Um, and we've talked about this at some length, but it, the social cost of carbon is the net present value of the damages expected to be caused by the, by the emissions of a ton of CO2. A uh, number of states have used uh, these kinds of calculations in both cost benefit analysis and for regulatory activities. Uh, all the states that are listed here um, uh, were identified by NYSERDA and Resources for the Future in a paper that they issued on this very subject. And this is essentially the current method that's been used by DPS, and it's one option that should continue to be considered when updating E value. But the, the calculations themselves need to be updated and there needs to be consistency with the way the DEC guidance uh, uh, has been issued. Uh, and I, I think the, a key point here is um, if, the, if we're not going to use a damages based approach or if there's a, a, you know, if there's a rationale for not um, using, using uh, an approach that cons that's consistent with what the DEC has done, then we would ask regulators and ICERTA to come up with an analysis and some clear analytic, uh, some clear um, reasons why we're not going to do it this way. So I think an analytical exercise would really help inform this part of the discussion. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we ended up doing was we took the, the DEC values um, that were issued in, in December of 2020, and we simply plugged those values into the DPS um, uh, spreadsheet that has calculated the avoided ton of carbon estimates in the past. And so uh, the, the, the little table on the right basically shows the range of discount rates that, that DEC contemplated. It shows the, the payments that would be made on a levelized basis uh, over um, on a dollar per kilowatt hour uh, uh, basis. And it uh, essentially that yellow bar reflects what the DEC estimate is. They call it what they're calling the central estimate. So that they're recommending using a two percent discount rate as that uh, central estimate, which would help drive the calculations. And ultimately, this would increase the uh, the kilowatt hour payment uh, uh, fairly significantly by about five cents. And what we're suggesting is that. Um, uh, there's this analysis should be updated and there's a number of other uh, aspects of these calculations, including updating the Reggie forecasts, looking at the marginal emissions rates that were included in those initial calculations. All of these things should be considered when we're, we're trying to establish this new value. If you're going to use this damages based approach, uh, I would note that the clean energy parties submitted a, um, a petition to the commission in 2018 recommending some changes to the way those calculations were made. And I think. Uh, many of those recommendations should be reconsidered in light of the discussion that we're having today. All right, so that pretty much summarizes method one. Let's move on to method two. Next slide, please. Okay, so method two, and this is the marginal abatement cost approach. Essentially what this is, is it, uh, it, it is an approach that um, uh, it estimates the avoided ton of, of CO2 and it, it, it's the cost of a, a, a cost of an avoided ton of CO2 with the most expensive abatement measure required to meet that CO2 reduction target. And so um, the abatement measure typically are sorted from these least cost uh, methods to the higher cost methods. And I think this is most clearly illustrated by that figure, at least it's on the right hand side of my screen, um, uh, Look with the uh, x axis reading emission abatement uh, cost. And you can see that in the early days, early, um, early days of the, uh, the um, abatement cost curve, or the, the, the beginning of the abatement cost curve, the prices are generally fairly low. But as you're trying to reach that last incremental uh, uh, ton of carbon reduction, you know, the, the cost curve increases fairly significantly. And ultimately, that price, that marginal, uh, that marginal price at the top of the curve, uh, helps set the uh, the societal benefit um, value for the entire curve. And so, typically, these kinds of marginal abatement cost curves are, are developed for a range of different technologies. And 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 this is a key point: they're developed uh, to meet a carbon target. They're not developed just to meet an industry deployment target. They're they're constructed so that you're actually trying to meet a broader carbon target. And that's critical, I think, in this exercise as we're trying to determine what the uh, appropriate E-value should be uh, on a going forward basis. Next slide. Okay, so what would that yield? Um, if you did 
a carbon a, a marginal abatement cost analysis. Uh, we try to get a handle on what those what those values may look like. Um, we're somewhat hampered here because we're not aware of any current specific uh, marginal abatement cost curve for new for the New York electric system, which is ultimately what you'd want. You'd want it for the electric system, and you'd want it to to be based on that uh, carbon reduction target. But uh, the New England Energy Avoided Supply Cost uh, Analysis does include some uh, a marginal abatement cost curve. And I think those um, that it's a it's a similar analysis. You obviously have two systems that have a, a fair amount of similarities in, in terms of the way they're structured. And so what we did here was we just lined up the uh, avoided energy supply cost analysis with the, the first year of the, the New York DEC analysis. And you can see that the numbers are you know, somewhat in the, in the same ballpark. Now, we're not recommending that we, you would simply use the uh, AESC study as it's been, uh, as it's been derived. Ultimately, what you want to do here is come up with a marginal uh, abatement cost analysis for New York, and that analysis should be advanced as part of the proceeding uh, so that we can actually get a, a real handle on what a New York number would look like. But with, for the purposes of illustration, we think there's some uh, there's some value in understanding that this is a value that's sort of in the ballpark of, of uh, what that number may look like. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Um, so, if if we kind of if you think back to the the slides that um, David Sandbank was presenting about the the marginal abatement cost approach at the beginning, there's a couple of couple of leaps we think that um, NYSERDA and DPS are making here that that need to be addressed. That uh, that you know a marginal abatement cost analysis is trying to meet that overall carbon target, um, but I think what the what the proposal that was advanced does is tries to show us a specific a marginal abatement cost analysis for a specific solar deployment goal. And that that's those are two very different exercises. You know, from the perspective of our members, the what that is, is ultimately is a revenue requirement analysis to help meet a deployment goal. It's not an abatement price. So that's something we have to um, uh, sort out as this proceeding continues. Um, you know, again, I think it because there are some uh, nuances to the way these these analytical frameworks would be um, implemented, uh, we have to better understand why the regulators would not choose to do a, a marginal abatement cost analysis on a carbon target instead of on simply um, a distributed solar target. So that's something we'd like to see see as this pr proceeding progresses. Next slide, please. Okay, um, and I. You know, I'd be remiss if I, I didn't communicate some concerns that the industry has about uh, the solicitation based approach that was advanced by uh, NYSERDA and DPS. Uh, uh, many of our members are, are have, um, have deep concerns about using a uh, solicitation to set the price of what um, the environmental value should be. Um, you know, it, ultimately, it's sort of abandoning Veter's goal of more accurately pricing what these um, the different uh, dynamic or the different benefits that these projects bring to the grid, and it sort of negates some of the dynamic and responsive nature of the Veter tariff in the first place, which we spent a lot of time building and trying to make better over the years, and we have. Um, you know, I would also say that at least for distributed solar projects, we haven't tried a, a solicitation approach. And you know it's it does take quite a bit of time to design that correctly and design a solicitation to get the results that you want, and we think that that would would be a time-consuming process. And I can speak to this um, uh, directly, and I, my the next speaker, uh, Caitlin, can as well. Um, you know these these competitive solicitation processes uh, tend to create a whole series of thorny questions that result. You know, should there be price floors or price ceilings? How often should the solicitation be offered? Um, what kind of um, criteria are used to, to ensure you have you know, bidders that will ultimately build projects as opposed to having uh, more speculative projects enter into a solicitation? And all these kinds of things take time to sort through, especially with uh, industry stakeholders. And that's why we're sort of focused more on Look, we, we know the E value could be improved to be more consistent with the DEC guidance. We know the E value is an important tool in a tariff, and we could make some adjustments to the way E value is calculated 
such that those projects would get the compensation they need, we could get hit the deployment goals that we need, and at the same time, ultimately phase out uh, additional incentives by just making some adjustments to the to the, the value that's actually provided through the, the VDR tariff itself. So um, thanks for uh, listening, and I'm going to flip it over now to Caitlin Kelly to talk about um, our solar goal and what we plan to do uh, on that front. Caitlin? Thank you, Dave. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, Dave and Gian have done a great job of sort of presenting where we are now and our response to the two different pathways set forward by NYSERDA uh, at the tech conference a few weeks ago. And while we understand that now we are in a, a larger conversation about reaching New York's uh, carbon goals, GHG reduction goals. Um, the clean energy parties really believe that establishing a new DG solar goal can be a very uh, important and useful tool in helping to guide the market to reaching those larger goals established by the state. Next slide, please. So everybody's goals are to ensure that the CLCPA is achieved. Um, New York really has set a very impressively high bar for decarbonizing the electricity sector. 85% reduction in GHG emissions by 2050, 100% electricity, electricity by 2040, 70% renewable by 2030, 9 gigawatts of offshore wind, 3 gigawatts of energy storage, and 6 gigawatts of solar, which as David Sandbig has clearly shown and which the, you know, the industry partners are very happy to support, we are very close to meeting. Um, you know, and then finally, 22 million ton tons of carbon reduction through energy efficiency and electrification. These are incredible goals, and the state has done a very good job of getting us on the path towards reaching those goals. And we just want to ensure that we continue to stay on the right path. Um, and New York continues to be uh, one of the top markets in the country for the deployment of solar, community solar, um, and providing the great benefits to all New York rate payers. So, you know, this is no surprise to anybody, New York is going to need far more than six gigawatts to reach the 100% zero emission goals and even 70% renewable energy goals by 2030. Um, and we think setting a new target can really help us to get there uh, along with in the context of the ongoing discussion for the best way to set the E value. Next slide, please. So, you know, establishing a new DG solar goal is is critical to reaching all of these uh, these targets. But in particular, uh, seeing significant GHG reductions by 2050, 85% reduction, uh, it's going to require uh, dedicated concentration in the building and transportation sectors and dedicated electrification. And what's that, what that is going to do is that's going to increase the state's load. Um, and what we need to do to make sure that we stay on track to reach those goals is that as we're seeing increased load, which will be offset with energy efficiency, of course, but can't entirely be offset. Uh, we're go we want to make sure that we have increased clean energy generation to match that increased load. So a lot of groups have already conducted studies about what will be required to help reach that goal. Um, the Brattle Group is one, and they conducted a study, and they say that between 3.5 gigawatts and 6.6 .6 gigawatts of renewable capacity, including 2 to 5 gigawatts of solar and 2 to 3 gigawatts of wind, will be needed to be added every year on average from about 2020 to 20 to meet the target. So simply put, to reach these larger goals, we need much more distributed solar in New York. Next slide, please. While there have been many years of, of studies and ways to assess how much distributed generation uh, is the right amount to add to our grid, uh, CCSA and Vote Solar are actually part of a coalition called Local Solar for All, 
And they are utilizing a new model developed by Vibrant Clean Energy that looks at developing state-based CG goals. And this new model uh, uses advanced analytics to produce a more complete picture of the direct costs and benefits of local resources on the grid. And really, the, the results of this model have shown nationally that a significant amount of local solar will help create a more cost-effective and resilient grid with increased additional benefits for all. It, you know, just nationally, scaling local solar and storage is projected to result in over 2 million local jobs by 2050. And the way the cost analysis is done is it, it accounts for direct costs and benefits only, but local solar and storage brings additional benefits, uh, you know, jobs, increased economic development, increased resiliency, and more equitable access to the benefits and renewables. So, you know, ensuring that everybody has a chance uh, to partake in the benefits of going solar and increasing renewable energy. And we are actually conducting a New York analysis uh, right now uh, that will conduct an analysis of the most cost efficient and best way to, re to reach the state's goals through 2050, um, you know, with recommendations for uh, certain amounts of capacity to be installed uh, among all, all sectors. Um, but also specifically for distributed generation. Next slide. So really in summary, with community solar incentives allocated, companies are now making investment decisions on projects that don't have an updated compensation structure. And without near-term confidence, Firms can't make those investment decisions, and if they decide that they need to pull out of a project, that's going to impact the state's ability to hit near-term and long-term clean energy deployment goals. Uh, the clean energy parties have explained the two options um, that should be considered by NYSERDA and DPS for updating the E-value to be consistent with the established DEC guidance. Um, and, you know, as we participate in this, you know, in this process, we're hoping that regulators can really fully explain um, and provide a data driven analysis to for choosing one path over another. And we, we believe that the simplest path forward is making adjustments to the veto tariff on the E value, um, you know, and not designing a new complicated process that will take considerable time. You know, as Dave mentioned, there. Conducting a procurement is untested in New York. It's not a, a guaranteed win. It, it takes time to develop and we have a successful program in place and we have a successful paradigm in place. Um, you know, VEDER is, is looked to by other states as, as a very, as a model policy um, and is really held up as an innovative way for compensating distributed energy resources based on actual value and having those values uh, help to uh, inform where, you know, where those distributed resources might be placed. So, you know, New York was ahead of the curve in the design of, of this and really as long as updates are made, it can, New York can remain on the path that is already on, which is compensating resources, getting beyond incentives, um, and seeing the successful deployment of clean, clean energy resources to help reduce carbon emissions and decrease GHG emissions into New York. So thank you. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, I believe is at the conclusion of the Clean Energy Party presentation. Yes, there there are some appendices at the end, but that's the conclusion of the presentation. Okay, and I believe this presentation, uh, I think John Garvey said it should be available to all uh, currently, and also we're going to have this uh, presentation and the recording of this WebEx on both the DMM uh, website from DPS as well as the New York Sun website here at NYSERDA. So I'm sure we're going to get questions asking if this recording is going to be available, and the answer is yes. 
Um, right now, what I'm going to do is open up the mic uh, for questions. For those that are presenting other, uh, you know, uh, uh, PowerPoints throughout this process. So first, we're going to uh, make this a little bit more of an interactive process. And I'm going to ask and see if maybe Stephen Wemple or Toby Hyde have uh, questions. Uh, if you do, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask the questions. If not, feel free to unmute yourself and tell us that you have no questions at this point in time. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I think I'll start off and I, I'm not sure. I think um, Dave Galt addressed it, but Caitlin did too, in terms of, you know, procurements. Um, just wanted to ask, you know, your concerns about a, a kind of a, a, a procurement to determine an e-value versus NYSERDA's experience with um, uh, the tier one rec procurements and even some of the utility procurements for non-wires. Well, why just, it's not obvious to me why, I, and I'm not recommending we do it, but, but why we couldn't do that, you know, for uh, distributed solar. And because it, at least it seems to me that the, the rec procurement mechanism, the tier one rec procurement mechanism, at least indicates a near term marginal abatement cost, because that's what we're buying recs for. And that's effectively the E value that utility customers are getting uh, through the VEDER tariff. And if there's a mismatch between, you know, the price we're paying for the E value and the value of the rec, that is effectively paid by all the customers in the subscribing rate class. So it still is an incentive, even though it doesn't look like an upfront incentive. So kind of a, a mixed thing on procurement and then sort of the mismatch between the an E value and the rec value. Well, I'll take a, a stab at feeling this one and then maybe Caitlin can follow up. Um, you know, I think I think one of our big concerns about just the, the, the solicitation and the procurement approach is, is based on the time it takes to design and implement and get the solicitation out in the field. And this kind of goes back to the um, some of the slides that uh, Shyam uh, walked us through about companies being in kind of a tough spot right now by having to make investment decisions without sort of a, a better sense of what that compensation framework looks like. So you add to that the complexity of of putting together a solicitation uh, for not, you know, not just a few projects, but potentially hundreds of projects um, to determine what the E value is. And it, 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 the, the exercise becomes quite complicated quite quickly. I mean, I'll just go back to some of my experience too, in, in specifically in Massachusetts, you know, there were so many questions that we had to wrestle with in, um, uh, with our companies and with regulators there when they used it, um, a solicitation for um, a program in Massachusetts, and it was, it was essentially, you know, the, some of the questions I talked about before, you know, well, how do you, how are you actually setting the incentive level? Is this, are you eventually just going to pay a clearing price at that level for all the projects? Um, how do you prevent um, uh, firms uh, from, um, you know, underbidding to, uh, you know, to to set the price or overbidding? And, and sort of gaming behavior, which obviously comes into, into play with these kinds of solicitations. Um, you know, there are a, a host of other ones about criteria that you use to make sure that you've got legitimate bidders that are entering, uh, entering a solicitation to help set the price. And, uh, you know, the market just doesn't have that kind of time. So that, that's essentially where we are, um, what, where some of our concerns are. And uh, I think, you know, I do want Caitlin to speak to this because she was involved in designing some of those solicitations uh, and, uh, you know, I can speak a little more um, authoritatively firsthand. Thanks, Dave. Um, yes, I completely agree with you. And, you know, I think solicitations, it, as Dave was mentioning in his, you know, in his part of the presentation, solicitations are seeking a different question than what Beter is. Beter is saying, here is the value of this resource. And solicitations are effectively asking, what is the revenue required to build this resource? And also, can you, do you, can you build it maybe cheaper than you might be able to? Are you trying to bid in cheaper than what other projects can bid in? And if you do, will that be a successful 
um, will the project be successfully constructed? Um, solicitations become more complex as you layer on other policy goals, um, which I, I know that the state of New York has a, a number of uh, goals and concerns um, in relation to the continued deployment of distributed generation. And, you know, as Dave said, that just, that does add layers of complexity, um, you know, as you try to figure out who is going to be responding to this, um, what is the goal of the solicitation? What is the goal for um, the impact of your of the solicitation on development after that on a future solicitation? Um, and I I would also caution that solicitations are are complicated and sometimes, as recently happened in the state of Maine, they're not successful. The solicitation, the DG solicitation issued by the state of Maine was deemed to be non-competitive, you know, and that was a solicitation that um, a, there was a significant amount of time um, and energy put into designing that. And um, at the end of the day, the, sol the solicitation itself didn't uh, produce results for the state. So, you know, I think it's, Dave's concerns and, and the concerns that I share are, are frankly that it's just, it's it's a different, a very different policy tool than what what's been used for DG development in New York so far, um, and it's it's not one that can be quickly deployed and really address, and really to address the primary concerns of a lot of the market participants, um, which is uncertainty now about where where the state is going and the viability of projects going forward. Just one quick point to add to, to, to Caitlin's um, answer too, and I think Steve, this gets back at something that you were saying, that, you know, that in the New York context, right, in the large scale context, um, New York moved forward with this, these solicitations um, for, for bigger projects. And eventually, um, and you know, there was progress made of, of on the development side of moving those projects to the pipeline. But eventually, many of those projects had they had to come up with a new. The commission had to come up with a new um, compensation structure using that index rec approach for those projects because the solicitation and the and the recs that were provided weren't stable enough to help get those projects, you know, to construction. So I think the New York experience with solicitations is even. Somewhat a cautionary tale on this front, um, you know, based on the fact that we were now only starting to see some of those projects that initially um, uh, have responded to the solicitations are only just now getting to construction. So, so I, I, you know, not to belabor it, but uh, assuming you know uh, DPS or the Commission sets a higher value of carbon and, and emissions. Should, I, I guess if I'm reading it right, Dave, you're, you're suggesting that should automatically translate into a higher compensation through the VEDER tariff, as opposed to compensating at the level that's needed for the projects to move forward. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to balance the two because it seems like we've got value and compensation is really two different things. And I think you're, if I understand you right, are, are you saying that they ought to be one and the same? Yeah, sorry, there's a little delay there. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think the point that we're trying to make is that there's this inconsistency between the DEC approach and and the the current the, the current way the E value is calculated uh, through through the beater tariff. So you need to upgrade update the E value calculations to to more accurately reflect the value that those projects are bringing to the grid, and that would in, that would result in an increase in the uh, the the um, uh, the environmental portion of that credit, um, and you know, I think it, the the regulators and, and DPS and DC, DEC and ICERTA were involved in a pretty complicated exercise to understand, you know, what the what those values could be, and now we just have to make it consistent across the use between agencies. Steve, if I could ask a question, and and this doesn't mean that Stephen and, and Toby can't ask any more questions. It's just subject related, so please chime in, uh, and let's make this interactive. 
Um, but I just wanted to ask a question uh, based on uh, just an increase in the E value and what your thoughts are. Um, sort of related to what Stephen was saying is um, number one, if the E value is increased, um, is there any concern to you at all that that is a fixed amount? And if um, the industry or the landscape changes and that E value needs to change, you're stuck with what you have, sort of the lack of flexibility of a locked in E value. I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts are and do you see that that E value needs to be updated time over time? I'm just asking you about the lack of flexibility with an administratively set sort of missing money E value, or are you thinking the E value is going to be closer to that 2% discount rate, which is means it's going to be about eight cents. And if that's the case, then it really blunts down the entire value stack. Uh, it's much more than greater than 50% of the entire value stack. And uh, really, there wouldn't be much per, uh, time and location benefit anymore. I'm wondering if you've put any thought into that. Yeah, I'll take a stab at it. Maybe um, I'll call on Shyam or and Caitlin to to address that too. I mean, I think I think we're, we're what you know we we as we've said a couple of times during the presentation, we think the the environmental uh, component of the credit should be should be updated. Now, there are a lot of there's a, there's a fair amount of nuance in those calculations, um, and and there are levers to push and pull. On how those calculations are developed for the E value. So, I mean, I think what you want, you want is overall consistency with the, the same approach that the DEC advised. So, that's the use of the 2% discount rate. But there are a number of other um, components of that calculation that could be uh, adjusted or could be revisited uh, to, you know, um, provide a, a, a set of values that are still consistent with the overall approach, but then support. Uh, support uh, CDG projects in New York. In terms of whether it should be re revisited, you know, I, I think so. I mean, I think the, the short answer to that question is um, you would, just like all aspects of the VDER tariff, uh, there are updates that should be continuously, um, it should be reviewed, right? I mean, there should always be some process of regulatory re review to make sure there aren't um, aspects of the tariff that are um, you know, not functioning as uh, regulators in the commission initially intended, but I'll see if um, Shyam or Caitlin want to chime in with that too. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, it's, this is Shyam here. Can can folks hear me? Yes, Shyam, we hear you perfectly. Great. Uh, so I don't have done to add on top of what Dave said. I, I, I guess except to say that, you know, we we we'll never probably. You know, land land, regardless of what uh, compensation mechanism or market support mechanism we land with, you know, it will never work out perfectly for all projects because of the dynamic nature of the, at, at least on of the, the the cost structure. There are just so many variables uh, that affect that, and that, as we've seen from the last you know five ten years, uh, evolve very rapidly, but. You know, it, and 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 the same point would hold, I think, for both incentives, uh, you know, an incentive-based paradigm, or, or even a procurement solicitation solicitation paradigm, where, you know, we have incentives that, uh, the, the megawatt block structure, you know, uh, would step down over time, but then, you know, it was still fixed for a particular block. So even if market conditions changed inside of that block, you know, you were still uh, the the incentive level was still fixed. It wasn't sort of dynamically responsible to a sudden change in in you know in the imposition of a tariff, uh, for example. And then I guess the same point I would make with regard to um, a solicitation approach, where you know in theory you could you, you know you you would you could argue that um, you know let's say we have a new solar import tariff was imposed, wouldn't firms simply be able to adjust their bids in the next solicitation to account for that change? And in theory, that's true, but but again, you know, solicitations are also not immune from some of these factors affecting projects uh, after the solicitation, because uh, of the length of time between you know a, a bid being made and then um, and then and 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 market conditions changing, you know, uh, after that point in time. So I would just add those two points in addition to what Dave said.
And are there any uh, further questions or follow ups from Steve or Toby? The risk of being, this is Toby, thank you. The risk of being accused of taking an idea too far, given what we just saw from Dave and Caitlin arguing for a social cost of carbon compensation, would you apply that to large scale renewables? And Toby, I think we heard you well, um, but it is uh, hey, Dave, your is this, voice Dave, quality is, this, is low. Dave, yeah. Hey, Dave, is this better? It, it's a little better. Yeah, I think we all heard you though. Um, Shiam, Dave, uh, Caitlin, did, did you get the question? I actually did not. If he could restate yeah, it, that would be helpful. Hey, hey, is this better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. So um, at the risk of taking an idea too far, we saw a ask from CEP to use the social cost of carbon at directly to compensate resources. Would you apply that standard in lieu of NYSERDA solicitations for large scale resources? Were you able to hear that? Yeah, I think so. I think I think Toby was saying that if you're if you're going to value the resource at, at the DG side, would you use that same value for large scale? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's something we can talk about. I'm not entirely you know, without more member input, um, I wouldn't want to take a real firm position on an answer to that question because you know we've been thinking about this in just the context of CDG, and a lot of our firms, there are a lot of you know large scale firms that are operating in New York as well. So you'd have to have more conversations with them to see you know see what they thought. But um, uh, it's worth thinking about. Thanks. Any other questions uh, from the joint utilities? So, so from my perspective, Dave Sandbank, I, I'd rather sh share the mic if there's uh, others and, you know, um, also interested in hearing what uh, Borrego has to say. So. Um... Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I will now. Um, give the opportunity from anyone from DPS staff to ask any questions. Okay, um, I don't think I hear any questions uh, from DPS staff. Uh, how about the NYSERDA side? Is there anyone from the NYSERDA side of the shop? I, I do have one clarification question I'd like to ask, but I wanna see if any of my colleagues have questions first. Okay, for not wasting any time, I'll ask my question real quick. It's it's more of a Shiam question, a, a clarification question. Shiam, in your presentation, you had said uh, the impact of regular uh, regulatory uncertainty is impacting uh, 100 of plus projects uh, in tune of 491 megawatts. Um, are those projects that you're saying impacted because of the uncertainty right now, are those mostly projects that are not yet in the New York Sun pipeline, they're just in the interconnection queue, or are those projects that maybe got a base incentive that didn't get a community adder incentive? Yeah, thanks, David. So, um, so, th so that, so those projects are um, projects that have essentially that are in the interconnection queue, but have missed out on the community adder incentive. So they should not be reflected in the New York Sun pipeline, uh, and because of the loss of the the community adder, they're essentially. Uh, not economically feasible at this point and therefore under the gun as far as whether to proceed or not. And just one 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 quick thing I'll point out is that a list uh, of 106 projects totaling 491 megawatts, that's just a snapshot uh, from four uh, CDG developers for the larger uh, New York state developers that we, we surveyed. So by no means is it a comprehensive account of the volume of projects that are currently uh, at risk, I would say, uh, or the uh, or the associated job impact. It's really a sample, or rather than rather than a a, 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 a full figure. 
Thanks for the clarification. And within that sample, Shiam, though, you say um, they didn't get a community adder, but they they won't be in the New York Sun pipeline. They there are a lot of projects that um, community solar projects that came in got our 11 cent base incentive, did not get a community adder that we consider a part of our pipeline. Are you saying that these are not those projects, or these are projects that are in the New York Sun pipeline, possibly? Sorry, th sorry, David. Yeah, thanks for correcting me. You're right. So so I I believe that those projects should have received a um a, a a a they should have been eligible for the base mega block uh, upstate cni incentive so you're right they you, you they should be or at least a large portion of them should be in the new york sun pipeline as well so i stand corrected on that point all right thank you uh any other questions for the clean energy parties across the board here um we we have a, a few questions in our chat box that we can review um, but I just wanted to see if anybody with a microphone right now has questions. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is read off a, a couple questions within the chat box, if that's okay. Uh, clean energy parties and, uh, and we'll, we'll be real time on this. Um, so, um, some of these are not questions, so I'm going to have to filter through them. Um, has the clean energy parties made an estimate of the cost to New York state of making the retroactive adjustment to the value stack that would enable finishing the projects in queue that might otherwise not get completed? And I can read that again, if you'd like. Has the clean energy parties made an estimate of the cost to New York state of making the retroactive adjustment to the value stack that would enable finishing the projects in queue that might otherwise not get completed? So very similar to the question I was asking. Yeah, so I'll take a step at that one. I mean, I think the, um, I think the, <laughs> there's a lot in this question. We have started looking at, we have started some analysis along these lines. I don't think um, our analysis is actually uh, a little bit bigger than just what's in the queue because we were trying to calibrate this with sort of the future of the CDG market, right? I mean, one of the, one of the questions that's on the table is what is the new solar goal going to look like? And, you know, to do a, a, a better cost analysis, you have to understand what your deployment scenarios are. So that's what we've been looking at. We're not, you know, we're not in a position to share that today, but that's something that we, um, we will be doing. Uh, but in it, you know, I think it's, this is also a task that, that, Regulators, and I certainly in DPS should be doing as well. I think this analysis is uh, important to understand and should be advanced by the um, DPS and ICERTA as part of the as part of the record of the case. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, most of the questions in the chat box are opinions. I'm going to skip through those. Um, some are legitimate questions, but I'm really concerned about time here. We've got two more presentations, so if everybody doesn't mind, I'd like to move forwards with the next presentation by Borrego Solar. Um, I would ask that Sam, please uh, unmute yourself and let's go to the next slide, please. And thank you, Clean Energy Parties, for all the work you put into the presentation and giving us your perspective. Okay, so we could see you um, and uh, let's hear you. Thanks, David. Can everybody hear me okay? Sounds good. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Jasinski. I'm Borrego's New York Director of Policy and Business Development. Um, before I get started, I'd just like to thank NYSERDA and DPS for their continued engagement and support for our industry and the opportunity to present today. Um, Borrego supports the positions outlined in the previous presentation by the Clean Energy Party. So the intent of my short presentation is just to share the experience and perspective of a long time leading DG solar developer in the state. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, next one, too. Thanks. So, Borrego is part of the New York Sun Beater success story. We've been developing DG solar in the state since 2014. Uh, we have close to 250 megawatts of installed. DG solar to date and another 100 megawatts under construction. When you add up how much we develop and how much we build, it's usually enough to get us the top uh, spot or two in, in the state. Um, so how do we get here? Mostly 
We followed the leadership of the governor, Nyserta, and DPS. The state has provided clear signals that it wanted a lot of DG solar, and through Nyserta's New York Sun program and DPS's hard work on the value stack, the state provided the support needed to get there. The administration's original DG solar goal of three gigawatts and the updated goal of six gigawatts signaled to us that New York would provide rewards, <clears throat> uh, would provide a large addressable market where we would be rewarded for making investments in the projects that would help the state reach its clean energy goals. In addition, um, New York Sun's declining block structure created predictability and continuity. And in our experience, that's been critical to driving down investment costs and encouraging us to continue and other companies to continue to invest heavily in community solar in New York. And, and the state's focus on reducing solid costs has also been the key to driving down the cost of these programs. The declining block structure allowed Borrego to continue to invest in projects, even when at the time we were making those investments, we did not have a direct line of sight to the specific block or incentive level that the project would receive. We were able to take those risks because we trusted that if we held up our end of the bargain, found good projects, kept reducing costs, that the state would hold up its end of the bargain by helping us overcome whatever remaining barriers were in place by the time those projects were ready for the market a year or so later. I, on the next point here, I, I know some will laugh by seeing the word efficiency associated with the current development process, but in our eyes, it could be much worse. The walk-up nature of the New York Sun program has helped to avoid overburdening an already challenging process with additional unnecessarily unnecessary timeline constraints and peaky demand for local state and utility administrative resources. And at the foundation of our successful DG solar market is the value stack, which has made great strides towards its goal of compensating these assets for the value they provide, thanks in large part to DPS's willingness to continually improve that value stack. These policies are working. They're why we and many others um, have opened and staffed offices in New York, steadily invested millions uh, in building DG solar pipelines in the state and contracted hundreds, maybe even thousands of local workers to get these projects operating, which all put New York on a credible path toward deep, deep, deep decarbonization. You know, the, the bottom line is Moreno really cares about the future of this market because New York DG solar now accounts for roughly a third of our revenue. And we wouldn't be here if it weren't for these policies and these programs and the commitment of a lot of the staff on this call who work with us time and time and again to make these programs work. Our success and the success of this industry is a testament to that working partnership. Next slide, please. But the market is looking a little different to us today and the future is uncertain. Um, according to NYSERDA's estimates, there's less than a gigawatt to go to get to six gigawatts by 2025. Achieving that goal is something absolutely worth celebrating, um, and we do, but 250 megawatts a year, only a fraction of which NYSERDA is projecting to come from CNI or CDG, is a small addressable market compared to the last several years of growth. In each of the last two years, New York has built close to 400 megawatts of DG solar per year for comparison, and most of that is coming from CNI and CDG. I started uh, reiterated at the top of this meeting um, that there's no in new incentive funding needed or requested. Now, that in and of itself is not a bad thing. Our industry should eventually be expected to sustain itself without direct incentives. For a good part of the CDG industry, that time could be now. But as things stand with our current value stack and no incentives, it's not clear to us whether the project we're investing in today are going to see the light of day. My service project economics. Um, and Stephen, I think this, this might uh, address some of the questions you were asking from Borrego's perspective anyway. Um, my sort of project economics numbers show that some of the CDG, CDG projects are expected to cost as much as 5 million more than the revenue they receive. Um, those numbers also showed scenarios where CDG projects break even, even without direct incentive. Those latter projects may exist, but they're extremely rare in our experience. They rely on optimistic energy and capacity price forecasts to be right. And developers have to write off a large portfolio of other projects just to find them. So in our view, most of the projects being developed today, and these are ones that the state is going to need to get to its 2040 zero emission goal, are likely to find themselves closer to the $5 million deficit end of the spectrum. But that cost revenue gap for those projects is not insurmountable with fairly modest adjustments to the value stack. And next, 
We have some major concerns about the unintended consequences of moving away from the tried and true declining block structure to a risky and difficult to implement auction approach. Solicitations have not been successful in DG markets as far as we know. Um, most experience the failure seen most recently in Maine. At a minimum, we expect the cost to develop our projects will go up, but getting solicitations wrong could also put the state's clean energy ambitions at risk. Um, while it's true and in some ways um, understandable to compare so the to 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 look at the LSR solicitations um, uh, when trying to answer this question, um, those appear to have been successful in recent years. But there's good reasons to be skeptical of extending that approach to the DG market. Um, for instance, most of the selected projects are still early in their development. They have yet to secure financing, and they're not under construction yet. Um, in addition, the volume, pace, and dispersed permitting authority of DG development will present a whole host of unique challenges that could lead to unfortunate side effects, such as high attrition rates, delays to project timelines, wasted municipal and utility resources, and higher development costs and write-offs. So we understand the importance of a rigorous process and we want to be productive participants. As I asserted, and DPS wrestle with the important questions that are before us. But as a business, it's uncomfortable to wait while the state conducts this process. Our costs are mounting, and it's becoming really difficult to continue to justify investment without a clear signal from the state that the projects we're building today will continue to be appropriately valued. Um, we have many good mature projects in our pipeline, and with the community adder incentives gone, largely gone in February and no success or policy in place, we're really confronted with two options. We put our limbo projects on hold, and stop developing, or we continue to develop at higher than usual risk. And really through this process, what the industry is looking for, Rego included, is the state to tell us which of those options it wants us to take. Next slide, please. So while my previous slides have focused pretty narrowly, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, New York Sun, Veter, and what's next for both of those, there are some broader market factors that, as a developer, we have to consider consider when ma when making our projects pencil. And these are also things that the state should consider in determining the successor policy options for this market. Some of these factors will improve project economics and technical feasibility, like a federal ITC extension, better interconnection cost sharing better distribution planning, cost reductions and technology improvements, and maybe even some module tariff reductions. But the reality is others will make or are already making DG development harder and more expensive. So um, as another testament to, uh, you know, the incredible strides that this market has made, good sites are harder to come by. Um, interconnection costs are increasing, and there's some federal labor provisions that are being discussed that might require prevailing wage for projects over one megawatt. Um, and finally, customer acquisition costs are increasing. So it's important to understand that these are additional sources of uncertainty for, for us and the market. And whatever policy comes out of this process is going to be operating in a future that's likely a mix of both these tailwinds and headwinds. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the ultimate question, which is how do we build on our past success? For one, we need a new state DG solar goal. Six gigawatts is a heck of an accomplishment, way more than that's gonna be needed to reach the ultimate goal of zero emission electricity sector by 2040. Um, Borrego, uh, in our, you know, we're really excited to have received our first NASERTA LSR contract. We're working really hard to win more this year, but there's a lot left for us and everyone else to learn about how to bring these promising utility scale solar projects to market and how, it will ultimately, how much it's ultimately gonna to cost to do that. In the near future, while those markets mature, the prudent thing to do is to continue to support DG Solar because it's the only sector that succeeded in bringing meaningful amounts of clean energy online, and there's tremendous value to society in achieving climate goals early and going beyond them. So our recommendation for how to get this right is largely captured in the Clean Energy Party presentation. From our perspective, complicated, lengthy, and risky overhaul of our current structures is not needed. Um, instead, a less risky and more expedient and justified approach is available. Increasing the E-value to be more consistent with the DEC social cost of carbon guidance within the existing VEGAR structure. Doing that will preserve the benefits of the New York Sun always on structure, avoid many of the risks associated with the more complicated and untested alternatives like solicitations, 
and it could end direct incentives to many community solar projects in the state, which would allow NYSERDA to focus its current and future funding on harder to reach technologies and policy, policy objectives, like reaching its clean energy storage goals and increasing LMI access to renewables. And finally, I just want to say that we also recommend the projects that missed out on community adder or base megawatt block incentives should be eligible for compensation for, for the compensation structure that ultimately results from this process. If not, some of these projects that could help the state reach its decarbonization goals are going to die on the vine. And at the same time, it would send a signal to the market that DG solar policy continuity in New York is no longer a guarantee. That new entirely avoidable risk is going to increase costs, discourage development, and make reaching the state's clean energy goals much harder. So I'll end by just saying I want to thank the state again and its agencies for getting us to this point and the opportunity to share this perspective on how to build on that success. Um, but to close, I, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Sam. I, I appreciate the presentation and obviously thanks to Borrego Solar and, and other developers, you clearly have uh, installed and, are in, and have a large pipeline within the state of New York. So you've definitely been a big part of our success and I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm going to just kick this off with one quick question and then I'm going to open up the mic to uh, anybody who has questions, uh, you know, that can unmute themselves. You, you had mentioned that you would like to see a, a goal beyond six gigawatts of distributed solar. One thing that I always wrestle with is how feasible is beyond six gigawatts with hosting capacity across the state? Um, have you put any thought into that or do you know any studies that you've done uh, to say, let's say hypothetically, and this is just a made up number, we go to nine gigawatts. Is that even feasible with the hosting capacity available today? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I don't have <clears throat> um, studies that I can reference off the top of my head, um, and I'd be happy to, you know, follow up with our interconnection team and, and, and development team and get a better answer to that. But I also think it's important to recognize that um, that goal doesn't necessarily have to be constructed within the confines of what's technically feasible today. You know, there's the TND planning docket that's open um, and plenty of other continual efforts to address those hosting capacity issues. Um, so I don't think a new DG solar goal necessarily has to be limited to, you know, the hosting capacity that's available now. Um, I, I think, you know, you'll hear us say in, in lots of other forums that there's lots of other levers that the state can pull to increase hosting capacity. Um, and, and I think we'd, we'd be big advocates of that. Yeah, I guess, yeah, uh, thanks for that. I guess my point is uh, hosting capacity is a big component in this conversation. And I just want to make sure that it's uh, it's on the table. We're looking at it, discussing it and, and take it into consideration with any thoughts. Absolutely. All right, let me open up the mic to anybody else. Uh, let's start with the joint utilities. Do you have any questions? Hey, uh, Dave, uh, uh, Sam, th thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if you could just um, uh, provide a little more color commentary on some of the headwinds on one of your slides. Um, what you, I, I get, understand the interconnection costs because that ties in with your discussion with Dave on hosting capacity, but uh, what's driving the customer acquisition costs and the diminishing credit? Uh, that was one of the headwinds that you cited. Yeah, I think, um, you know, again, it's, it's, it's part of a maturing mar maturing market where, um, you know, as you subscribe more and more customers, um, you know, it could be harder and harder to find new additional customers to subscribe. Um, I think that's a piece of it. I think, um, the other piece is that, uh, you know, and I, I, we don't have this number necessarily off, off the top of my head, but, um, the. Um, the project economics um, and the and and the financing are uh, directly related to the credit worthiness of offtake, um, anchor offtake, and um, for remote net metered projects. Um, and so the 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 market for um, anchor offtake that is in those higher echelons of credit worthiness um, is finite. And so um, as that as that market expands or more projects are trying to find those customers, um, inevitably, you know, there are going to be some step functions in the credit worthiness of those anchor off takers, and that's going to impact um, financeability for these projects. 
Right, thanks. And, and Stephen, I think I understand your question as a slight preview to your presentation. Um, I've been privy to seeing it, so <laughs> I understand where you're coming from, I think. <laughs> And and I I just you know as you know, you'll hear from me in, in in a little while there's actually a lot of similarity I think we all share some common goals so uh, but anyway thanks Sam for clarifying that sure. thanks uh, any other questions um, for Sam from anybody else Toby oh, Hyde real quick Sam you made a reference to a piece of prevailing wages legislation was that a state or a federal uh, that was that was federal. Thanks, Sam. Just a, I guess a reoccurring question I'm wrestling with, which is, you know, based on the Clean Energy Party's proposal and your proposal, headwinds, tailwinds. I understand all of the points and everything. Um, how does that work with a fixed incentive without the ability to, to, to travel up or down? Like maybe a solicitation would be, I complete, like, I really have been an advocate for, uh, certainty and transparency, especially in the design of the megawatt blo declining block. Um, never been an advocate for, uh, the solicitation model, but now I'm, I'm really starting to, to, to look at every option to see what's going to best suit the future. Um, and it's really hard for the state to sort of find uh, a missing money and and put it in there and whether it's the form of an e-value uh, below the the two percent discount rate um, or something else like it's really difficult to put the state in a position to try to find that value um, and once you find it it becomes stale immediately or sometimes quickly and so i'm wrestling with the lack of flexibility um, of, of a non-solicitation approach is there any sort of um, feedback you can give us on that uh, how, how can you do something that maybe has some more certainty, but we really have to take ratepayer consideration into effect. We really have to figure out something that works for distributed solar, but also is the best bang for the buck. Maybe not all projects are going to be able to be built, uh, but at the same time, maybe some of the better projects can be built. I'm wondering if you can give us some feedback on that. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think what it comes down to for Borrego is, um, we're not convinced that solicitations can actually achieve additional flexibility. Um, you know, there's a trade off between um, the resources needed to run each procurement and how frequently you can can run them. So um, even even in an annual procurement approach, for instance, um, you're talking about projects that have you know around a twelve to eighteen month development time frame. So um, a lot can change even after a solicitation has has just completed for a project um, that may have won that bid and 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 is being uh, built a year later. I think Dave Gall may have even mentioned um, you know some of the adjustments that have had to have been made after solicitations for for um, reasons like that. And I think the second major concern is um, kind of. Uh, if there if there are flexibility um, if there is flexibility to be gained from a solicitation when it comes to headwinds and tailwinds um, solicitations are likely uh, to be won by bidders that are willing to um, bet on all of the tailwinds and ignore a lot of the headwinds um, and so uh, you know there's there's just a lot of unintended consequences of um, that type of speculation, high attrition rates, um, and things like that. So what you might end up with is um, uh, an annual solicitation um, strike price that you find out at you know six to twelve months later um, was full of projects that expected only the federal ITC extension, um, but didn't expect to be paying prevailing wage, and those projects no longer pencil. Um, so that kind of uh, that kind of outcome sort of deteriorates the the benefit of of whatever flexibility you might expect from a solicitation, and and on the flip side, um, you know we think that the walk up type programs, um, flex, that flexibility is not mutually exclusive to solicitations. Um, there there can be mechanisms um, built into a walk up program or uh, a a tariff approach. Um, I think the question was asked earlier about you know reviewing the e-value um you know and i think i think 
doing an annual procurement every year to get flexibility or building in some mechanism to review the e-value uh, and the assumptions that go into that on some sort of periodic um, time frame is 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 completely appropriate and and could be the way to achieve that same type of flexibility without all of the risk and unintended consequences that that and concerns that we've listed with a solicitation approach. All right, thanks. I could ask you a million more questions, but for the sake of time and uh, for the sake of momentum, maybe we should move on. I'm going to do one last call for um, any other questions. All right, thanks again, Borrego and Sam, uh, for your presentation. Uh, appreciate Thank you. the time. Okay. If we could now go to the next slide, and we're going to be uh, we're going to have the joint utilities uh, present. I know both Steve and, and Toby are going to present. Steve, I see that you've enabled your video, so I'm assuming you're going to go first. So I will uh, mute myself and allow you to continue. Great. And if we can start off with the next slide, and while we get there, uh, probably one more. Um, there's actually, you know, a lot of commonality between the various presentations, and in, in, in spite of what. Um, sometimes comes across as differences. I, I think everybody agrees that distributed solar is an important tool uh, that, you know, uh, is a part of the CLCPA, has helped us get to, you know, the 6,000 megawatt uh, target and, and is well on its way, as you heard uh, David uh, describe. And, you know, um, I, I, I think, you know, what you'll hear from us is that it it can and should continue to uh, play a big role as we go forward. And out of what I view as that sort of distributed solar bucket, uh, community distributed gen or com uh, community solar, as some people refer to it, it is also an important uh, tool that I think, you know, it, it's important to separate the two. And so what you'll hear from Toby and myself is a thought of, you know, a continuing role for CDG, but recognizing that it may have some limitations and it, um, you know, we should look to make sure we've got the right tools in the toolbox to get to uh, a robust distributed, uh, and I'm going to even call it a distributed renewable market, making sure that we're not just focusing only on solar, because there's some other emerging renewable technologies, whether it's some creative thoughts in the East River to put in some tidal turbines to capture the tidal uh, power, whether it's some of the upstate applications related to uh, agriculture, capturing some of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, methane from some of the uh, dairy farms and, and other applications. And there's even rooftop wind uh, turbines, both in New York City, as well as ground mount wind turbines in people's backyards upstate. So there's lots of applications of renewables. And, you know, from our perspective, we need all of the above to get to some of those CLCPA goals. Uh, so what you're going to hear from us today is the thought that we really should look at a holistic approach to accelerating clean energy and uh, what distributed renewables uh, make sense and how to attract them. And Toby's going to go through some design principles for um, those distribution connected resources and hopefully, you know, tease out from everybody on this call, panelists, you know, DPS, NYSERDA, as well as some of the audience to get everybody thinking of, you know, what, what are the next steps that we need to keep the momentum going because the CLCPA does have significant goals. And next slide, please. And we need, you know, as I said, an all of the above approach to, to get there. So um, New York clearly needs, you know, a number of different resources, as, as you've heard me say, uh, distributed renewables are important. Uh, David Sandbank says it explained it well. It's close to load. It avoids line losses. It's typically on the correct side of a constraint in constrained areas, especially like New York City. If we can get more distributed renewables up and running, that um, you know helps get it to customers better than, uh, in some cases, uh, remote projects that might find transmission constraints at certain uh, times of the day, times of the year, and be less deliverable to customers. So out of that, you know, what we're really talking about are a bunch of tools to get to the CLCPA, 
goals. You know, different people will talk about large scale renewables. It was great to hear that uh, Borrego was actually participating in that market in addition to uh, community distributed generation. You know, we're very excited to see a lot of offshore wind come into the downstate area. Uh, we're very excited about some of the uh, transmission that's being discussed to make sure all of those renewables are deliverable to customers. We're also very excited about energy storage to make sure that the intermittency of some of these renewables can be stored and utilized uh, or stored and deployed when customers need it most. But today's focus is really on distributed renewables. And as you know, I've said, you know, we've got a couple of tools. We have the broader VEDER tariff. Uh, that's a great tool. It provides customer engagement, either for an individual customer installing renewables and exporting to the grid and getting compensation, as well as in a remote net metering configuration where you can have uh, multiple uh, sites that are benefiting from a customer's uh, uh, solar project. And now that uh, we've expanded it to include you know, kind of a, a 1 to 10 uh, within remote net crediting, you know, there's more flexibility there. And, you know, I suspect I, I won't hear any contradiction from uh, the development community that the VEDER tariff provides greater compensation and certainly an easier form of compensation than selling directly to the New York ISO. So putting these under a state tariff has certain advantages. Uh, and a subset of the VEDER projects is really the community distributed generation. And it's been a great tool for helping customers that don't have ready access to deploying renewables, either those who rent their home, those with unsuitable uh, roofs or shaded uh, property or, or apartment dwellers who, who don't have roofs uh, associated with their property to let them be engaged with and participate in and really be proud of, you know, uh, supporting renewable projects. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's kind of a look at one of the uh, NYSERDA slides on where we are. This, the, if I'm looking at the bottom uh, left, uh, the uh, installed uh, renewables on the system, um, the vast majority are some legacy hydro projects. We have some land-based wind and, you know, um, a meaningful but relatively small compared to the overall mix piece of soul of um, solar in that mix. And then sort of the dark blue in the middle of the left bar that then explodes off on the right, uh, which is the contracted, you know, the things that are in flight. Once again, you know, we've got a good mix of offshore wind, uh, uh, large so solar, more land-based wind, uh, and, you know, distributed solar being supported through the New York Sun uh, incentives. And, you know, once again, distributed solar is an important, albeit, you know, smaller than some of the other legs. So, you know, at, at least we recognize that we need an all of the above solution to get to those uh, CLCPA goals and that uh, distributed solar is an important tool and CDG is one of the delivery mechanisms for distributed solar. But you know, our pitch today is we should make sure that we have the right tools to scale and we want to get the best tools to deliver the most clean megawatt hours to our customers as cost effectively as possible. Uh, I'm going to, you know, refer back to, although not asked to pull it up, but in one of David Sandbank's uh, introductory slides, he showed the relative cost of community distributed generation and uh, remote credited uh, projects where community distributed gen was about 10% more expensive than some of the remote crediting. And what we're suggesting is there might even be another category of distributed solar that could be even more cost effective. And we don't wanna leave anything off the table while we explore what we need to get to the post 6,000 megawatt goal. So next slide, please. And the reason we want to explore alternative, well, things to supplement CDG is because 
having worked on it since the original VDER tariffs, since the original Solar Progress Partnership that proposed, you know, alternatives to net metering, which became the basis for the VDER tariff. You know, it, it's a, as I said, it's a great tool, but it's not obvious that it can scale to meet all of the CLCPA goals. As you heard from Sam, you know, it's getting harder to find customers to it's subscribed to these projects, and it's not obvious there's enough engaged customers to scale into the thousands of megawatts of projects that we're going to need going forward. Um, the evolution of VDER has been, you know, uh, it's resulted in a complex set of tariffs that are hard for developers, customers, and utilities to implement. And that sort of complexity also means that it's been hard to automate and deliver efficient business processes. Doesn't mean it's not a good tool, but here's an area where I think we, if, if you heard what uh, the Clean Energy Party said, we, we shouldn't do you know, a fundamental overhaul of VDER because that would make it more complicated. I, I think the utilities are in agreement that, you know, continuing to try to, you know, and I, I picture like a, a, an old car, you know, can, can I add a turbocharger to, you know, the normal air intake, uh, you know, um, and what is that gonna do to the car? It's gonna enhance it, but it's gonna make it perform a lot differently. And I need to relearn how to drive it. We're a little concerned that if we keep trying to use CDG as the only tool with extra enhancements, at a certain point, it becomes harder and harder to drive, and it may not be heading in the right direction. Um, we heard from Sam, which is something that we've heard from lots of other people, that customer acquisition and, and relationship costs are a growing soft costs that are adding to the cost of these CDG projects and the uh, impacting the ability to finance the revenue streams. Uh, another concern, which is a significant one, um, less for Con Edison, because we're not seeing it down in uh, the New York City, Westchester area, but much more so upstate, where you've got parcels of land that are ideal for something bigger than five megawatts of renewables that are getting subdivided to meet the CDG five megawatt threshold. And in terms of kind of the long-term goals of what do we need to get as many clean megawatt hours onto our grid and delivered to our customers, it's a travesty to see a parcel of land that could handle maybe 23, 24 megawatts of solar getting subdivided into four separate five megawatt parcels where the setbacks between each of the parcels means there's some land that could have had solar panels if it remained one parcel that are sort of lost to the renewable uh, potential of that parcel. And then in terms of interconnecting into the utility, it means it's four separate meter sets and four separate interconnects. Whereas if it was a, you know, a, a, a 27 kV feeder, it might be able to handle all 20 or 23 megawatts as one interconnect. So it's creating cost for developers to do this subdivision to hit the five megawatt threshold, as well as cost for utilities on the interconnection side. And in some cases, if that substation that it's be, that, that uh, those projects are being interconnected to has a limited breaker positions, we could then um, effectively eliminate the or re significantly reduce the hosting capacity that would otherwise be available for other projects. So we're taking a, we're both driving up costs and potentially constraining the ability to interconnect more renewables. And finally, CDG, as I said before, the compensation is greater than going straight to the ISO. Um, it does result in some artificial subsidies and revenue shifts to other customers. And, you know, some of these can last for 25 years. You've got the New York Sun, which is an upfront payment, as well as the community adder. You have the E-value, which is currently $10 over the value of the tier one renewable energy credit. That's a 25 year lock in. And you've got some hidden subsidies in the uh, some of the ICAP uh, options, as well as some other market mismatches. So next slide, please. 
So that's why we think it's worth taking kind of a holistic approach to looking at clean energy and looking at, are there better ways to incentivize distributed renewables uh, to help us meet our REV and CLCPA goals? You know, because the environmental goal customers receive the benefits of renewable projects consistent with, you know, some of the uh, um, charges in CLCPA, you know, we could probably find a way to be more targeted to some of the disadvantaged communities to make sure they either benefit from um, the, you know, uh, the net benefits coming from some of these projects or benefit from the proximity of some of these projects in their communities. Um, and ultimately, you know, we're, we're looking for a, a mechanism that provides support for the solar industry uh, in a sustainable way and ideally getting to an unsubsidized or, or as reduced a subsidized business model as possible so that we can get the most clean megawatt hours for our customer dollars. And at the end of the day, for those of us that have worked with VEDER and its evolutions, we, we want to make sure that it's not perceived as the be all end all tool, because otherwise we're gonna wind up in a Rube Goldberg end state that's gonna constrain us from getting to where we wanna go. We really want a stable framework that can adapt to market changes as well as technology advances. I think you heard from David Sandbank asking some of the other panelists, you know, how, how do you make sure that you're flexible and nimble and can adjust to changes? I, I don't have a good answer for that, but you know, I, I know that's an important thing. And I think we all agree, we want compensation to be commensurate with the value that customers get, not just the value the subscribers get, but the environmental value everybody gets. And if we can find ways to make these projects more financeable and scalable, that should help drive down the soft costs and be good for everybody. So with that, I'm going to ask for the next slide and hand it off to one of my colleagues, Toby Hyde, to talk about some design principles. Thank you, Stephen. Can everyone hear me okay? We hear you just as good as we heard you last time, Toby. So whatever you did didn't make a difference, but I think it's good enough. <laughs> Keep All right, projecting, David, how Toby. about David, how about this? This is a little the old broadcaster voice. My apologies, folks. My my puppy has made some structural modifications to my mic and it has not helped my mic this week. Okay. Um, um, so yeah, let's, if you just speak up, like Steve said, I think it would be helpful. Thank you. All right, here we go. So um, the first um, design principle, and, and this would apply to any modifications to the value stack, is really, as Steve was emphasizing, delivering clean megawatt hours to uh, customers across New York State, um, consistent with CDLCPA goals, um, and to send accurate price signals. And this is something that um, I think the, the value stack is really um, at the forefront uh, in the nation in doing, and um, we would like to see continue and um, be, be more accurate moving forward. Um, and three, you heard uh, transparent and technology neutral. You heard Steve talk about some of the uh, potential uh, nuances, come uh, new technologies coming, whether it's, it's tidal or, or uh, rooftop based wind, or more, more recently in the value stack, you know, anaerobic digesters were added a couple of years ago. Storage, um, I think, is really one of the strong points of the value stack and the, the application to new technologies, whether it's injection and we're, we're forward looking, it's got already injections from um, potential electric vehicle charging stations, for example. So I think that's really one of the um, absolute arguments in, in favor of, of the mechanisms that the state has, has refined in the last few years. Um, for uh, reduced administrative and regulatory burden, I don't think, um, and, that, and that matters obviously whether you're your Borrego or any other developer, we, we saw them today, or National Grid or Con Ed or ONR, um, as, as we'd like to see programs that work, that can be implemented uh, in straightforward and efficient fashion. Um, and fairness and equity, um, obviously a, a key part of um, the promise of distributed uh, community distributed generation um, legislative targets now enshrined in the CLCPA. So anything that we're doing beyond the six gigawatts of the first target has to be consistent with both the, the principles and also the legislative targets. Uh, 
next slide. I recognize that I'm between most people in the weekend, so we'll try to keep this moving pretty quickly. Um, so the first the first argument is that compensation should be as accurate as possible. And so um, you know, we, 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 start, we suggest that, that utility customers should only pay for the market-based values and demonstrated avoidable costs. So we know what energy costs. In fact, the NISO set, a, I think, a record low last year with the average uh, price per megawatt hour of 25 bucks and change. Um, so we know what those, we know what that costs. We know what a, a rec costs, and I sort of publishes rec costs. And um, we know uh, <clears throat> what uh, the, the cost of, of avoiding certain distribution infrastructure um, value of that is. So we, we do believe that if additional financial support is necessary, and we've heard it referred to as missing money today, NYSERDA should provide it. Um, and doing so would allocate costs more fairly across utility customers. And so what we did is we took a look at the share of interconnected PV by company, by service territory, and that's in the graph at the right, and it shows changes over time for the last decade. Um, you see where, where development was once rather concentrated on Long Island, um, as share of the state, uh, we've seen growth in National Grid's territory. That's the blue at the bottom. We've seen growth in uh, NYSEG RGE's territory. That's the gold line in the middle. Um, and some uh, wiggles around uh, Central Hudson in, in the, the middle of the decade. So the point is that as if there is missing money or, or, or incentives, as, as Shyam described them, um, they should be uh, fairly done across utility customers. We're, we should not be uh, burdening the, the customers of one particular company uh, to meet statewide targets um, by themselves or even disproportionately so. Um, and we've heard a lot today about the, the standard offer. Or, so if, the, if, if in fact, so if in fact additional support is necessary, which um, you know, we've heard two different mechanisms proposed, NYSERDA offers a standard offer, um, or a competitively bid mechanism. I think there are well-established advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, and I think for now we're not taking a position, although um, we'd like to flesh out those advantages and disadvantages of both um, in this proceeding. Um, next slide, please. So this is really the, the heart of the um, I don't even want to say proposal here, but the, the framework, which is a, a non-CDG option to compensate resources. We heard from Sam that the customer acquisition costs are large, growing, and, and an increasing um, problem. And, and that's true when we've talked to other uh, developers and, and many, many folks on this line. Um, and so we, we think that there's a path here where we can eliminate customer subscription. And, um, all customers pay utility surcharges, whether it's the value stack, um, rather, rather in the value stack surcharges. So all should benefit from DG projects. So the um, utility or the NISO or NYSERDA would directly compensate project for, for the values, so energy and capacity based on wholesale clearing prices, the value based on the rec clearing price. And I do want to pause here for a second to um, go back to the March 9 order that created the value stack that was rather clear on this subject that the um, compensation of the E-value should be based on the latest tier one procurement price published by NYSERDA, which um, that was, I believe, page 106. Um, and that is 100% consistent with the marginal abatement cost approach that we've talked about today. The, the marginal abatement cost is simply the cost of a REC. And the, the footnote that allowed for the use of the social cost of carbon referenced a trend, referenced the idea that it was supposed to be a transitional mechanism. And here we are in 2021, four years later. And so we think that that transitional mechanism um, has run its course. So the E value should be properly denominated as the tier one rec value. And um, moving on to D value, those should be done on up-to-date uh, avoidable costs. Um, and, and there's been a, a lot of work in this area, although a, a, a paused, paused a bit uh, more recently. So to the extent that out-of-market cost, out of market costs remain, um, we do think they should be collected fairly from utility customers. Um, 
and also, you know, eliminating the subscription model where uh, projects are um, either selling directly into the NISO if they prefer or selling their energy and capacity to, to the uh, relevant utility and devalue comp receiving devalue compensation from the utility um, is, is absolutely consistent with CLCPA compliant um, requirements rather um, in terms of directing benefits of these projects to um, low, low income customers and disadvantaged communities um, in any number of ways um, we can we can adjust elections or, or change change the way uh, credits are assigned but um, that is absolutely a, a set of design criteria we can work through that I think is a, is consistent here um, I did that a little bit out of order intentionally and um, next slide please Uh, can we move to the next slide? There's probably a delay. Sometimes oh. he, he always clicks it when you say, and then you've got to take a couple breaths. That's that's a good reminder. I'll take a breath. Take a drink. That's right. So um, the so you know, in addition to the elimination of the subscription model and direct compensation for injections from um, utilities to uh, projects, we would advocate for a, a regular and structured um, review. Um, and I think we heard a little bit from David on this point about flexibility and making sure that the uh, compensation structures are matched to um, state goals and project economics. Um, and, and what we've also seen certainly in the, in the CDG proceed in, in the 15E0751 and, and other associated CDG proceedings is lots of lots of petitions and and um, a rather high regulatory burden recently. Um, so we'd like to see that consolidated into a, a regular review and and coordinated review. Um, I'm not sure what the right term is. Right? We have we have programs that ha different programs have different reviews. Um, DLM programs are reviewed annually there are filings in the fall and orders not long thereafter um, you could imagine a, a two-year biannual uh, review um, the recent uh, make ready order from summer of 2020 uh, to subsidize uh, ev chargers um, created a midterm review in a five-year program um, a little over two years from from the order itself so i don't think that the ju has a strong preference at this point on cadence and i, I we, we raise this to, to tee this up as what the right cadence is for um, a regular structured review um, that could adjust uh, you know, the distribution values. It could adjust um, the, the, the NYSERDA support mechanism, in our view, um, or any other features of, of the model. Next slide, please. Um, and so, while we're suggesting that resources need not um, that all that all resources need not um, you know create subscriber lists, do the customer acquisition, which is a very significant piece of the cost stack, um, we don't think that it's necessary to eliminate it um, entirely. If there are projects and companies and resources that think that's important to um, their way of, of business and their um, their business model, um, we we support that, and we we're not we're not present, preventing that, but we do think that there should be a an alternative where uh, projects can sell their output directly to utilities, or if they're large enough and interested, directly to the so or get their eva e uh, their their rec straight from NYSERDA. But the, the CDG remains an option, but there is no mandate to pursue it. And key in this idea here is that to the degree that there's missing money and that the um, projects need extra. And, and again, Shane referred to this as the incentive structure of the community credit. Um, we think that that kind of, that kind of incentive should, should come from NYSERDA and be reviewed and reset uh, again on that, on that regular cadence. Um, and there's no need to have that embedded in individual utility tariffs, whether it's Con Ed customers downstate or NIMO or, or NYSEG rg &E upstate. Um, next slide, please. So, 
So I think we laid out some some ideas here. Um, is, does this count as a major structural reform? I'm not sure, that, but this this certainly is a um, a, a refresh consistent with I think uh, the, the uh, present presentations from staff and NYSERDA, uh just a couple weeks ago, and we look forward to really fleshing these out and working with staff and development communities, other stakeholders, to see if this can deliver um, clean generation, clean distributed generation, um, at cost effectively to all of our customers across New York State. Um, we do we do recommend a little more process here, um, maybe some more Q&A. We've had some questions today, and I thought there's some really good, fruitful exchanges. Um, and I know uh, staff is preparing to do some writing on the subject, but we, we do um, recommend a little more process here on, on CDG reformation, and, and this is clearly the right working group. I don't know how many hundreds of people were on the line this second, but it was in the hundreds last time, so that's a really outstanding expression of interest and again thank you to, to NYSERDA and staff for convening this group um, and, and we appreciate this opportunity to to work with stakeholders in this working group um, and do think that there's probably room for a, a little more work um, together to, to bounce uh, ideas off each other and, and react to things that we've heard um, today and I think that's it I think that takes us to next steps and I hope that you heard that just fine. And um, I'll pause for breath. Yeah, I think your puppy did just enough damage to muffle you, but we were able to hear you uh, fine. Thank you, or at least I was. And, and Stephen and, and Toby, thanks for your presentation, obviously. I agree with you, Steve. There, there are some commonalities and threads here um, that, that are through every presentation. You know, and I'm really happy that we have about 40 minutes to uh, to get through some questions and answers here based on your presentation uh, and some maybe overall uh, general questions that we could possibly answer as well. Um, I, I'm definitely going to hand the mic over to the other presenters to ask questions. If, if you don't mind, I'd like to kick off a couple questions um, myself just because um, I have the mic now, so I might as well ask them. Uh, Toby, the one thing that you had mentioned, and maybe Steve even mentioned it as well, and it becomes a, a thread here, is sort of finding, um, you, you had said we're we should transition to a tier one rec value rather than the social cost of car, rather than the higher of two, let's go to the tier one. Uh, it's sort of a two-part question is, number one, how do you determine what the rec price is when it's indexed and you have to unbundle it? I mean, that rec might be zero when you unbundle it. And if it is, are we saying we're done with distributed solar? I'd actually like to hear from you on the first. My impression is NYSERDA still publishes a um, compendium rec price um, for the purposes of alternative compliance payments. So I don't think we're at zero yet, um, but you raise a fair point about, so are we done with distributed solar? Not necessarily, um, but, but I think you raise it, another interesting point, David, um, about index Rex, which is, is that an idea we should borrow here? If well, yeah, are, yeah. Right. So yeah, I, I'd like to explore that a bit more. If, if the big guys are getting the index Rex, should DG get the index Rex? I'm not sure, but it's, it's a provocative question. It's an interesting question, Toby. You know, I, I, the last thing I want to do is take the value stack and throw it out the window and an index rec could blunt the value stack. I mean, an index rec for everyone is just really getting a fixed um, value combining LBMP capacity and E value together. And that essentially fixes a stack, which makes financing a heck of a lot cheaper. So to compare um, much more risk on the distributed value stack side with an index rec is not a fair comparison in my opinion. And so it's really something that we'd have to look at. Do If we did a competitive solicitation, would we index it with just LBMP so that capacity and DRV can still drive time and location? Do we not index it? Um, I'm just saying that um, your statement of let's go with the tier one rec price, there's a lot of evolutionary work that's been done with that rec price. And that really is oversimplifying it in my opinion. And we'd have to figure out where to go from there um, because it could be just the end of distributed solar possibly if we don't 
do the look at the nuances. Go ahead, Steve. Sorry. No, no, David. I, David, can I respond for a second? I, I think I was, sure. I, I was thinking more about the, you know, the latest tier one rec price is nineteen bucks per megawatt hour and change. But you're right; it is part of a, a more cohesive package. And um, I, I also think you're right, which is our intention here is not to. And I want you to interpret this as proposing a mechanism that unduly places significantly higher risk on DG than on large projects. But I, and so, you know, if, if they need to be part of the same competitive procurement or a different competitive procurement, I, I'd like to hear from you on that. I think those are both interesting and fruitful avenues for exploration. Thanks, Toby. Yeah. And, and, and David, I, I think so, some of the intent of suggesting using the tier one rec is to try to put all renewable technologies on the same footing because if they're all providing a environmental benefit in the form of a carbon reduction it shouldn't matter where they are and you know wh whether it's a uh, you know 100 kilowatt project exporting you know a little bit because most of it's consumed on on site whether it's an existing or a upcoming cdg that's at you know 4.99 megawatts exporting virtually 100 percent whether it's a 20 megawatt, you know, or, or 80 megawatt solar project, you know, somewhere upstate, the environmental benefit from that injection should be viewed as the same. And, and one thought, just speaking of, of the cuff is, you know, you, you could take, you know, a multi, you know, a couple of years average of what the NYSERDA price is that they're selling RECs to all LSEs and have that be a, what I call a slowly moving, but relatively stable value and near term, the blend of the renewable energy credits that NYSERDA is buying for LSEs is, you know, the current mix is mostly fixed price. So it'll take a little while for any volatility from the indexed RECs to come into that average price. So, so, so there are different ways to get there. I don't wanna solve it on this call, but the thought would be, the environmental attribute should be common. We, it, I, I would not want to see a different valuation for solar than for wind, than for run of the river hydro, than for tidal turbines. In, in, in my mind, renewable energy, if we can get it to customers, helps back down fossil fuels. And regardless of whether it's cow power or, you know, I, I've always fantasized that we could get all of the uh, uh, soul cycle machines into little dynamos and produce electricity that way when everybody gets back into the gyms and starts exercising. <laughs> That's, I, I, I don't know if it meets nicer this definition of renewable energy, but that would be a wonderful thing, right? All right. Have Thanks. You, have, you, yeah, just, have you seen my diet? <laughs> I've seen your bicycle though, Toby. <laughs> yes. I can I probably just wanted, give you about a quarter of a kilowatt hour. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we all understand. Sometimes we think we're comparing apples to apples and we're not, um, and that we have to look at the nuances. That's all. No, it's a but, fair point, so David. And I, I think it's a good one. And I, I think it's worth exploring further to, to Steve's point about how we unify the key value across technologies and sizes is really. And, and, and a separate question. It's not, it's not that we don't, we, we, we a completely important question related to today's discussion is, does that still leave some missing money? And if we need some miss, we need to fill that missing money. Let's be upfront. Let's identify it. Let's come up with a, an efficient way to fill it. Uh, and so I'm not saying that the tier one rec is the solution because I don't think it is, but, you know, let's be. Uh, transparent about the values that we're putting on things as opposed to valuing something. And, and if, you know, the, the way to raise the tier one rec value is to increase the RPS goals, you know, that that's a separate issue. You know, there's also things happening at, uh, you know, New York ISO to try to put more of the energy value or the environmental value into the energy price that everybody sees. Those are all great things that can help the market. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, I think we should approach all renewable technologies comparably. And then if there's a need for some missing money, let's find the best way to approach it. Uh, you heard from Toby, our position is NYSERDA 
I think is best positioned to serve in that market transformation role. But, you know, in the past, the utilities have also contributed in some fashion through some of their incentives as well. So I think everything needs to be on the table. All right, thanks, Steve. That, that's helpful. Uh, appreciate that. I'm just curious. I, I this will, I promise, be my last question of this series, um, and I really want to hear from everybody else. Uh, when you say NYSERDA should provide, are you talking about uh, an example of maybe going back to more funding for a community adder approach? Yes. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, I want to open up the mic to uh, let me try to be organized here. Uh, let's talk. Uh, let's open it up to uh, clean energy parties and see uh, if they have any comments or questions. Hey, David, so uh, and thanks, Steve and Toby. I, I had a quick follow up one uh, a quick set of follow up questions basically on your non CDG option that you're that you're talking about. So if, if I understood you correctly, you're you're, you're considering, um, you know, it, you're considering creating sort of a new framework to support uh, these non CDG, CDG projects. And there wouldn't be subscriptions involved with them, but they would still what would what would the size of those projects be? Um, you you sort of suggested that earlier that you you felt like the Veter stack has um, some flaws with 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 respect to how it re, uh, compensates capacity, but that slide you showed included capacity in those calculations again. So I was curious about that, and then. Like, who's the owner of these projects? Is this um, who would was was this develop you know independent development firms that are owning this, or is this some other kind of arrangement that you've you've? Put no, out? Dave. It would be Dave. Let me try to let me start answering. There are a whole bunch of things in there, so let me start and then make sure that we, we get all all of them in. For, I think the the model would be similar to today. We would expect third party firms firms, many of whom are on the line to be developing the project. And the difference is that rather than generating credits denominated by the value stack and selling those to customers, they, the projects would be selling their output either to distribution utilities um, under a value stack like construct with some small administrative changes to, to capacity, I think um, all three is the one that, that does it correctly. And I think most things are coming in as all three or most non solar anyways coming in as all three, but it would look like the value stack to, to compensate them for their, um, for their injections. And, um, it would remove the responsibility for participating resources to manage subscribers and turn credits into dollars. Um, essentially it's sort of a major extension of net crediting, but even further again, removing any subscribers. To your second question about, uh, I think you, and so I think inherent in this, and we, we're a little light on this, is, but the idea is that we actually are, are interested in the idea that projects should be free to, to sell um, their attributes um, where it makes sense. So if, if a project wants to participate in NYSERDA's rec programs, and we just had that exchange with David, um, for the e-value, that's that's fine. They should be encouraged to do that if a project wants to participate directly in the NISO because they think they're worth more there because there's some solars paired with storage and they can chase some ancillary services value in addition to energy and capacity, which are in the value stack. That would be fine too and, and earn direct compensation from the utilities for EG. So we think this is a more flexible model by removing some of the constraints around subscribers um, and credit assignment. Um, we're not proposing necessarily a change to the SIR, but um, be curious to hear your response to that. Did that address all your questions? And Steve, did I make sure, did, did I uh, capture all of them? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think you, you hit what I heard from, from Dave. I, I, I think we are though open to, you know, the SIR, has a standard interconnect for up to five megawatts, and then there's a different process for over five megawatts. My earlier comment of the when a larger parcel is subdivided into smaller parcels, I think that's something we should relook. And in a 
different manifestation of you know a veter like compensation if you had a larger project coming to us that was connected at a primary feeder um i I, I think everything should be on the table for discussion, and that could be, you know, something bigger than five megawatts getting potentially a distribution benefit based on where it's interconnecting, as long as it's interconnecting on the distribution system. Steve, are, I'm sorry, are you uh, recommending increasing the SIR cap? Well, so a project can interconnect to our distribution system. Uh, it, it's a non SIR application if it's over five megawatts the five to 20 yes the five yeah, to 20 the five to 20 and i i know they're working out sort of um yep. streamlining that that process yep. now as well making yes. it more transparent yep. so so that back to that example of a parcel that could have put you know i'll use a different number of example to get into that five to 20 range could have put you know, uh, 18 megawatts if it was a single parcel and instead subdivides into four separate parcels, it is not going to get four and a half megawatts out of the four separate ones because of the setbacks. It might be uh, four megawatts times the four. So and it's Steve, I'm sorry, megawatts. I think I, there's just been an order out recently. I don't know if it was just for National Grid's territory or all territories that that's no longer needed, uh, that there doesn't have to be a physical parcel separation. No, no, uh, it does not have to be a separate tax lot, but it has to be a separate um, interconnection. Uh, interconnection, which yeah. is an issue, and yeah. I believe that it still needs to, when it files for the building permits, be treated as if it was a separate parcel and have separate setbacks between the four parcels. Okay, so, yeah, I wasn't aware of that. You could be right. Um, but I, yeah. I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying, because, um, you know, I'm assuming that any project greater than 5 megawatts is not eligible for the value stack, right? Currently, yes. And I, I'm just saying, saying um, if, yeah. if we're looking to get beyond 6,000 megawatts, let's look at what is possible. Currently, okay. anything bigger than 5 megawatts can either sell to the NISO or it can basically be compensated under our buyback tariffs, which a lot of large traditional generators, uh, you know, uh, do that. It is not tailored for renewables, but that's why we're suggesting, I think everything should be, we, we don't have a solution here, but we think a possible solution set should be better utilization of some of those larger parcels where the landowner and the town is happy with being developed into 18 megawatts of solar. Thank you. That's a good point. Uh, Shiam, I know you have a question, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's uh, yeah for either Steve or Toby. I, I, I think um, I, um, I, I uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you mentioned that the JU's position is that the E value should really be the tier one rec price. And I'm just, you know, there's a couple of um, couple of points there that I wanted to raise for clarification. So one, you know, the, I, I believe the commission, you know, the commission has approved the existing formula for the calculation of E value, which is a higher of the uh, SCC and the tier one rec price, and then the CLCPA uh, did uh, direct uh, that DC perform an updated SCC value, and that other state agencies should take that into account in their uh, rulemaking or calculation. So I'm just trying to clarify: is is are you taking issue with either of those directives there, or am I not understanding uh, your position there? I let me offer a. Touch of clarification, Jen. The order that created the value stack, March 9, 2017, ordered that the compensation for environmental value, and this is now a quote, should be based on the latest tier one uh, procurement price published by NYSERDA. However, in the footnote on that same page, page 106, um, the commission wrote that consistent I believe, here, let me get you the exact quote, uh, as recommended by staff as a transition mechanism, 
phase one resources shall receive the higher of the tier one rec price or the social cost of carbon. So there's no question that it's written in the commission order. What we're suggesting here is that that transition period has run its course and that we should return to the argument in the main body of the text that the E value should be the tier one rec price consistent with renewables of all kinds in the in the tier one solicitation. Um, and if there is, again, additional financial support needed for projects, and I sort of stakeholder group should work, for, work, work forward and figure out what that is and what the best mechanism to do that is in a transparent support mechanism. But the E value, we think it's rather clear that the E value as intended is supposed to mirror the tier one rec support price. And, you know, as we just talked about with David a few moments ago, slightly change for index recs. So, you know, maybe it's something like an average of the of the alternative compliance payment over a three year period. But we think it's quite clear that the E value should be the tier one rec and that if there is additional support needed, it should come in a different and transparent mechanism. And just to follow up, Shyam, when we pay more than the tier one rec, we then go back to our customers, the actually the subscribers to the CDG project. So hypothetically, if all of the project's subscribers were residential customers, the difference between the roughly $20 tier one rec and now going forward the $31 e-value, that $11 difference per megawatt hour times about a thousand full load hours, that amount of dollars we will collect from the residential class of customers, because that's what the VITER order directs us to. So we're just saying there is in the current mechanism of still using that transitional language, that is, you know, a less than transparent subsidy. And if projects need additional support, we should just identify it and it 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 would be better to be more transparent about that additional financial support so it can be reviewed periodically and reset. I think your other question is the CLCPA directive to have DEC look at that and have the agencies consider it. Uh, that's up to DPS staff to consider whether that's an appropriate thing to adopt. And that sort of ties into one of my earlier questions or my earlier comments that we can value something higher than differently than we set compensation. So if the commission wants to say carbon across the board should be valued at, pick a number, $48 and 32 cents. I'm just making it out of thin air because I'm not recommending that. Uh, we can put into our benefit cost analysis that value and any programs we contemplate, you know, should be judged against that. Uh, in many instances, we use measures like that, and to the best of my knowledge, it's only in the VITER tariff that we have defaulted to setting compensation directly at that. I would also add in addition to echoing exactly what Steve said, I, I, my memory is, and I don't have the entire text of the CLCPA memorized or on my desk in front of me the second, but it ask DPS to create and or the Public Service Commission to create um, programs consistent with six gigawatt goal um, and any further DG deployment. So I think there is quite a bit of flexibility embedded in the law in how compensation is determined in addition to the other studies that it prescribes, as Steve was talking about, about paying for um, the distributed generation to come on the system cost effectively. Thank you. All right, thanks. I'm going to ask if there's any more questions uh, for anybody that has a microphone. I'm sort of going through some of the Q&A in the chat box while, while, uh, while someone steps up and asks a question. And I will say, uh, I would say about 80 to 90% of the uh, quote unquote questions in the chat box are more comments. So uh, that's why it's taken me a little while to go through them, which is good. Um, I love the comments, um, very healthy conversation. All right, I'll help you out there, Dave, and ask a question. This is Warren Myers. Uh, Steve, um, and Toby, I was uh, curious 
when you talked about the inefficiency of dividing up parcels and wanting to consider all options, uh, are you also talking about considering expanding the five megawatt cap for CDG as well? Warren, that was not in our proposal. What we were suggesting is that we don't think CDG is the right tool to scale to meet, you know, a beyond 6,000 megawatt target that we need to open up different distribution uh, distributed renewable uh, uh, options and, and create different distributed renewable tools. So I think the openness to consider compensation for things over five megawatts is for this new category of what I'd call directly compensated resources. And that could be, you know, if a, let's pick a number, if a 10 megawatt resource interconnects in onto a 27 kV circuit, um, you know, I, I I think it would be reasonable to suggest that they should get a uh, D value or an LSRV value based on where they're interconnecting and the relative value there. Uh, if they're selling all of their energy to the utility, they should get a uh, energy capacity and and a rec value. If they go right to the NISO, uh, you know, I I know we've discussed decoupling. The, the Veter tariff to allow sort of the a la carte where somebody could participate in the NISO market to Toby's earlier point, maybe they could provide some voltage support and other services to the NISO uh, or some reserve services if they're paired with a battery and still get the uh, LSRV. But no, we're not suggesting that CDG be expanded to resources bigger than five megawatts. Thank you. All right, thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the chat box a little here if you don't mind. Um, one question to the uh, joint utilities from Brandon Smithwood is uh, as a follow up on seeing a slide on D value, is the joint utility arguing that D value should not be based on forward looking marginal prices? So we could ask Warren when we're going to get back into the <laughs> wonderful marginal cost uh, uh, proceeding that we, we were discussing, I'm going to say about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, sh short answer to uh, uh, to the question, to Brandon's question, uh, we, m marginal cost should always be forward looking. Uh, unfortunately, what is in our each of the utilities VDR tariffs are, are somewhat outdated. Uh, cost studies, which were the best at the time. Uh, when we all published our respective updates, we used different approaches and, you know, DPS staff appropriately said they would prefer us to be more consistent. We haven't yet closed the loop and defined uh, a consistent approach. So I think there's still some homework to do when staff and the utilities and other parties have the bandwidth to revisit that and and i'm looking forward to doing that and i think the reason i called out warren i think he mentioned it at the last tech conference that that might be something coming and not that i'm looking forward to it but you know i i think that would help give us some guidance going forward when we do get to that looks like you're gonna have to unmute warren sorry yeah, no, I did mention it and we are still working diligently on it. The only thing I'll say about that is that I think different parties have very different expectations about which direction marginal costs there are going. I, I think that's very true, Warren. And um, uh, but at, at the very least, it would give us the ability to differentiate locations in our service territory because uh, the original LSRV zones that we've identified have effectively gotten, you know, with the exception of some in Manhattan, where there isn't a lot of opportunities for distributed resources in some of those dense urban areas, most of our other LSRV zones are, have either been saturated or are close to being saturated. And a refresh of that would at least help us tell developers what locations have greater distribution benefit than other locations. I'll let you have the last word on that, Steve. 
Okay, thank you. Um, here's a follow up question by Mr. Smithwood. How is the process proposed by the joint utilities consistent with the timeline DPS staff has proposed for a white paper and SEPID proposal? And just as a memory, uh, and this question also came up, what is the white paper timeline? Um, I think you'll see in our next steps, we're trying to shoot, I think, Warren for like midsummer to get something published uh, on, the, on the formal white paper with a 60 day SAPA comment period after that. Uh, so Steve, I don't know if that provides you any color as to um, you know, execution on, on some of your ideas and, and how that works with the, the process here, but I'll give you the opportunity to see if you have an answer. I have faith in Warren's ability to write quickly um, and, and others, uh, but I, I think I think it would be Brandon if there's, if there's things you'd like to follow up with. I, I think we'd welcome a, another meeting or two, um, and I think that we still have time before midsummer. Sounds to me like July. Uh, the, but, but I but I can't speak for DPS or NYSERDA's, um, uh you know drafting and, and schedule. But I, I I think it's consistent. And, and it certainly if you, could. Think, if you think the good writing that ends up in white papers and orders is warrants, you, you, <laughs> you're being very complimentary to me, but there are a lot of people involved, including counsel's office. How about the good ideas? Can we give you credit for them, Warren? But back, back to I think, the, <laughs> the, the, I, think I, I, I think the timing works either way because the way I'm reading it is. You know, NYSERDA and staff have kicked off this process with some thoughts, asking for input. We're providing that input. We look forward to other people kicking the tires on that. I, my, my sense is there's probably some solar developers that would be interested in developing mid-sized projects that don't need to uh, uh, sell exclusively to NYSERDA that might want prefer a utility uh, a, a PSC tariffed form of compensation from the utility, and if that appeals to them and avoids the, you know, um, the soft costs of finding subscribers and the credit issues of having myriad contracts with lots of, uh, you know, dispersed off takers and puts it all into one and that helps reduce project costs. I think that's worth exploring because as our, you know, and, and whether that's in comments you know, that staff considers and puts into their white paper, whether that's in comments after the white paper is published, I, I, I think we've got time to explore this. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Adam Cohen. Uh, is the joint utilities proposing that such greater than five megawatts, quote, a la carte projects can be required to participate in buyback and standby tariffs? I think you might have answered this though, Steve. So, so my read of it is that a larger over five megawatt project, the if they wanted to sell to the utility, the only tariffed mechanism I'm aware of is our buyback tariff, which is for injections. The standby is really a what I call the other way charge. There's standby charges with a contract demand, but that is not compensation for exports. The compensation for exports would be under our buyback tariff. And there are several large combined heat and power uh, entities that do sell to the utility under our buyback tariffs. Thank you. I am. Uh really looking through some of these comments as you talk. So give me uh, a couple minutes to regroup and look through some of these questions. Um, there is uh, quite a bit, but uh, mostly comments. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go on mute. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and ask away.
I'm going to read a, a comment uh, from Ann Reynolds at ACE New York. Um, the comment is there will be some interesting interactions between these two programs if the new DER compensation JU is proposing goes up to 20 megawatts with an E value equal to the sale price of the tier one rec. An example of that is from the previous year's procurement or some other way. As some projects would then buy 19.99 to part, I guess, megawatts to participate in that trend would then influence the going forward prevailing tier one rec price. Um, not really a question, an observation, I guess, submitted by Ann Reynolds. But yeah, um, Stephen, it seems like um, there's a lot of chatter about your increasing the, uh, the, the system size here. This is, this is Warren. I'll just make the point that I think we've made before, and that is now that we've transitioned to indexed rec contracts um, and because, you know, market um, energy and capacity prices differ across the state, uh, the rec prices aren't so much a reported fact anymore as um, strike prices minus an administrative forecast if you come up with one that everybody should use. And so it's it's now becoming, if we wanted to use rec prices going forward, it becomes more of an administrative modeling approach. Thanks, Warren. And um, those chirping birds in the background really work for you. Um, appreciate it. Or Warren is a man of nature. <laughs> Well, my dog is anyway, and, and the, this has gone long enough for her, so she needed me outside with her. Okay. Um, does anybody else on the line see any questions that I'm missing that uh, need to be asked here? Meaning uh, in the Word document that we're looking at. Can I respond for a second to Ann to Ann, Ann's comment there? Please, please. Which is, I guess, our perspective is today under the um, current value stack and the E value above that is decidedly above rec price that we're ha we have interactions today. There are impacts on um, so. Um, and certainly on utility customers paying more for certain environmental attributes than for others, which strikes us as not particularly desirable on its face. So I think that the interactions are really important and I'd like to tease out and maybe in, an, in a subsequent session where what you were thinking and how to make it more consistent across resources. All right, thanks, Toby. Uh, Warren, I have a question from you from Mr. Adam Cohen. Um, what is the time scale for MCOS studies that set new LSRV areas and updated DRV LSRV rates? There, sorry, I'm having trouble getting my unmute button to work. Um, so don't, we don't have a due date but we're working diligently and trying to get it out as, as soon as we can. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a there's just a lot of um, comments in here, so I think I've gotten to the majority of the questions. Um, and uh, And I would just say that um, we have six minutes left, so it's probably a good idea for me to, to move on um, from this presentation Q&A portion and get to the rest of the slides and wrap this up. So, John, if you could please advance. Thanks. Um, and next slide, please. Okay, so we were talking about next steps. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, for now, um, you know, we heard from the joint utilities say that this process is working. Um, it sounds like uh, Stephen, you had asked or maybe recommended another uh, opportunity to have a technical conference, which we don't have scheduled scheduled at this point. However, if others think that could be helpful, please let us know. Right now, what we have scheduled is we are going to um, 
uh, submit at the end of this May, at the end of May, at the end of this month, a technical conferences proceedings document. It's a document that's going to summarize what we've discussed here. Um, and uh, once that document gets submitted, it's something you can look at and and uh, and and use as a summary for any which way, shape, or form you need to. Um, but the real meat on the bones is going to be the staff uh, white paper uh, that's going to be followed by a SAPA comment period. We're targeting the summer, uh, midsummer, for that. There's a lot of work that that has to go into it. Um, there's a lot to consider here. Um, obviously, we've got uh, many different perspectives. Um, you know, I think we're all concluding that we would like to see distributed generation continue um, beyond the six gigawatt target, but we have to ask ourselves at what price, uh, at what methodology, and at what capacity. You know, we have to ask ourselves, uh, we have to do cost benefit analysis uh, on each particular option. Um, see what ratepayer impact is, see what deployment is, see what hosting capacity is available. So uh, I'm, I'm only giving you the tip of the iceberg as far as things that we need to consider. So there's a lot that we have to put into it. Um, and it's going to be something that we're going to have to put a lot of focus and effort and resource into. Um, once that's, you know, uh, distributed and, and posted, there will be a SAPA period uh, following that. Um, I know the industry has asked for an interim uh, approach as to uh, what we can do in the meantime before the SAPA comment period is over and then um, in a, a, a order uh, is, is put forth and, and voted on by the Public Service Commission. Um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure there, there's tons of options there. Um, this is a regulatory process that has to be played out. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're probably realistically looking at anywhere between October and December is in, in an order. Um, that's guesswork based on um, how quickly we can get the white paper out and the comments that come back and uh, the agenda for the commission to approve. Um, so uh, we're doing our best to move as fast as possible. But one thing I don't want to do is move too fast and mess this up. Um, whatever we do has to be a benefit to all New Yorkers. Uh, and has to work for not only the distributed solar uh, stakeholders and developers, um, but also uh, for the totality of New York State and ratepayers. So uh, obviously there's a lot to consider here. I think this was a very healthy discussion um, to kick off the process. And this is basically a process we are kicking off. I will say, I think we've proven in the, in the past um, that New York State has been very collaborative, um, that we listen to our stakeholders and that we put a lot of thought into it. Uh, we really maintain that position um, and we intend on doing that uh, moving forwards uh, so we can't rush through it. Um, but at the same time, we completely are sensitive and understanding of the time sensitivity involved uh, in those developers that have to make decisions and milestone payments that they have to pay. Uh, so it's a tricky balancing act. We're trying to do the best we can. So please try to bear with us um, you know, as we move forwards throughout this process. Um, if there are others that feel there, there would be a benefit to another technical conference, maybe after the white paper is published, uh, please let us know. Uh, we didn't intend on having one, but, um, but again, we're open-minded to the needs uh, and wants of, of the industries and stakeholders. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, I generally said we'd have time for a final Q&A, but we don't. Um, but I think we've had enough Q&A um, to satisfy most people's needs. So I think we're able to sign off now. I'm going to pause and see if there's anything from uh, Department of Public Service staff that would like to say anything at the end here uh, or any of your colleagues from NYSERDA. Hi, this is Warren. I want to echo your thanks, uh, David, to everybody. And uh, I'll assure you that we will also be looking at all the comments that David didn't get to um, and and take them into consideration and just know that we understand it's always it would always be good to do more analysis and be able to move faster but you must understand that those work against each other we're always trying to balance uh, the need for uh, getting to the commission as good analysis as we can as as good as is needed for the decisions that need to be made in the time frame they need to be made so uh, I think you could see from one of uh, the clean energy's slides the the big cost difference 
for rate payers between the um, social cost of carbon calculations that uh, the commission has approved based on a 3% discount rate versus the social cost of carbon calculations that DEC has, uh, you know, uh, promulgated. And uh, that kind of cost increase can't possibly, no matter um, how much people want us to just say, oh, that's automatic. It is not. Um, the commission has to be consulted about that kind of cost impact. So that's, that's, I'll just let it go and thank everyone for all of their input today and their future input. All right. Thank you, everybody. Again, this recording and presentation will be available on both the uh, DPS and NYSERDA websites. And NYSERDA will send out an email to all the participants um, when that's available. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, David. Thanks. Okay.